Well, hello and welcome to the show. Today I've got a man in here that some of you might know as Turbo Yoda. Now, Turbo Yoda, your real name, Alan Butler, you've hosted a show that a few people have watched over a couple of years. Uh, what's that show called, buddy? Uh, yes, I'm the former host of the, the Skid Factory, which is uh, uh, me and Woody, who currently is the sole host of the show since I've retired from that job. Is he going to change the name to Single Pegger? Uh, possibly. Because if he's not the Skid Factory, because, I mean, if we're not laying a number 11, if we haven't got the two of you, it, it, yeah, he, it, could do. he might be Single Pegging. We'll have to. At least for a while. I can suggest it. Is there going to be a Turbo Yoda Jr.? Is there a young Padawan to fill well, I have a, a big set of, of shoes? Well, I have a couple of young Padawans for myself, but I don't know mm. what, he's, what he's doing. No? No. So just to, the, that one's a wait and see? Yep. You have to keep tuned in, I suppose. Keep see tuned in to Single Pegger do, Factory. I don't know either. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Mate, you yeah, surprises. Now, you've been doing that for how many years now? I think it's about seven years since we started filming the first build that we did so we started that in about february seven years ago and then did the entire build and then released the first episode after it was all built because it was obviously an experiment at the time so yeah we've been doing it for a little while a little while do you have any idea the volume of content you've made have you got uh i can't tell you exactly but we it, it was a weekly we did one episode per week for, I suppose, six and a half years, uh, plus extras that sometimes we had more than one episode, but always one a week was and, our goal. And you managed to always hit that goal? Yep, yep. The only time we didn't do it is when we scheduled to have a couple of weeks off, one one Christmas time, and then we got punished by uh, the YouTubes for that. Really? They just, yeah. Oh, it just drops you off the radar because you're not you consistent. Get yeah. out. Are so you we serious? never did that again. <laughs> Holy shit. It's yeah. that important yeah. that they penalise yeah. you for it. Well, some people, some channels, they don't, they don't worry about it. But wow. be, I guess it's because we were always the same time every week. Oh, my which God. Which we did for well, – I did that because I thought if, I, you know, back in the 80s when I wanted to watch Home and Away, I wanted to know <laughs> that it was going to be on the same time every week. So that was – Bloody earth, what, mate. Same bad time, same bad channel. Yeah, that's it. So uh, – that's, that was the reason why we did that. Maybe it's a bit old school of me. I'm down with that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's, it was a bit of fun. That is a shitload of content. And for people that don't understand and go, what a cool life, you're living the dream, how much work goes into that one episode a week? Uh, well, we've got the build work, of course, so uh, I'm... Generally speaking, we were building a car, so that could take three months, six months, whatever, depending on how hectic it was. Um, but obviously we'd film it and then I didn't do any of the editing or anything like that, so I can't really tell you how long that takes, but it, I'm, I expect it was probably at least a day for a, a basic uh, edit and sometimes more if, it was, if we were doing something fancy with... Uh, like sometimes we had a you know a special car like that uh, Hakasuka. I'm going to get in trouble for saying that wrong. Uh, Skyline. So we we did some a bit more creative production on the introduction of that that vehicle, and uh, just as an experiment, and that, that took a lot longer. But uh, generally speaking, if it's just a basic build episode, it'd be you know, I guess a day's editing. So uh, yeah, and then I might spend a whole week getting that half an hour episode in actual building of the car, of course. So, yeah. Because for people that haven't built cars, if you haven't actually done this sort of stuff before, it can be very... Hmm, it can be very difficult to understand how much work goes into each thing that you have to do. That, like, running a cable could actually, like, take 10 hours if you're trying to get something from the front to the back and things go wrong and then you've got to compact it down into... Yeah, the stuff that's totally not interesting is the stuff that takes heaps of time. So Yeah, it's not very sexy yeah, stuff, yeah. is it? <laughs> no, that's it. There's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff you've got to do that, that is 
well, it's just not interesting, but it, but it's still got to be done. Otherwise, the car doesn't doesn't bloody work. You, you, yeah, that's it. You can't keep going with it. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's just part of it. All part of the fun. And see, what I'm finding wild here is, mate, I've got you here at, I guess, a pivotal moment in your life's journey because you've just sort of, you know, you've stepped back from that position and uh, having a bit of a look at life in general. Mate, what I want to know is before you were Turbo Yoda, take me back in time, mate. Tell me a story. Where did young Alan uh, grow up? (coughs) Uh, so I was born in Gympie and lived uh, not in Gympie but in the rural outskirts of Gympie on a farm uh, my whole life until I was an adult. Uh, went to school there, public school, the normal stuff, nothing special. Not very good at uh, not very good at concentrating at school, that's for sure. But uh, you get that when you're a teenager got other things to think about but uh yeah I, I moved away from the area because i needed to get a job and there was no work this was early 90s when there was a recession so everything was pretty dry as far as work and opportunities so i ended up moving away and moved to the sunshine coast because uh, i could get an apprenticeship there as a mechanic so that's what i did now, mate, growing up on a farm in Gympie, there's pretty serious uh, plots of land there. Did your family, uh, were your family, was it agriculture? Was it yeah? Cat- uh, what, what was what was going on there? So my both my parents were from farming families, and they did all types of farming. But there was also no money in farming back then either. So they had a big dairy farm, um, and that basically didn't work because the cooperatives that they used to control the pricing and everything so people didn't go broke um, they all got shut down around that that sort of 70s in the 70s about when I was born and then you it's probably the start of what people talk about now with Coles and Woolworths being you know monopolizing the the milk and that sort of thing that had happened a long time ago um, to a different extent so they got out of farming and just had normal jobs, but also always we always lived on a well, it was probably a hobby hobby farm, like a twenty four acre farm, and had, we had cattle and that sort of thing. I used to milk cows and that that was my one of my jobs and feed pigs and all that sort of stuff. Just normal well, stuff that I thought was normal for for a kid. Uh, normal in Gimby. Well, normal if you normal if you're me. <laughs> so yeah, I've got some. Some serious cow milking skills, if, if ever ever required. Mate, that'll be handy in the apocalypse. Yes. Yeah, You'll be able to yeah, rebuild maybe. a car and milk a cow. Yep. Bloody hell. Definitely. I don't even drink milk. So, but, uh, no, that'd be good for the rest I of the can, squad. I can trade it for oh, absolutely. other things. For, yeah. For petrol. Because <laughs> did you get into trail bikes, machinery, where you're a tinkerer? What, what else do you... You can't tell me that nothing happened. I mean, you would have got up to no good. You would have... Found your way into mischief. There's many, many good things. I'm, I'm interested to know about young Alan. Was he, you know, loose cannon? What was he up to? Yeah, well, it was the 70s and 80s, so you pretty much... Good times. Parents went to work and you didn't see him. You just uh, just did whatever, rode around on your push bike. Uh, didn't have trail bikes because they, they were too expensive and I don't think my mum liked the noise, which was... Annoying because I really wanted one. But Bloody earth. I just had BMXs and that sort of thing. And, yeah, we just used to, I don't know, swim in dams and rivers and ride around and just, yeah, do whatever we <laughs> wanted really because there was no one to tell us not to. And, uh, yeah, sort of worked it out as we went. Uh, plenty of stacks, plenty of injuries and that sort of thing for the for the well, mum to deal with. But uh, just how it is. And when did the dairy farm sort of cease to be profitable? Uh, that was about when I was born, so in the seventy mid seventies. So um, then they moved to the farm that I grew up on when I was about one. And, uh, yeah, and then um, my dad actually became a driving instructor, so he had a he had a driving school for, really? for quite a many years. So teaching like teenagers. Yeah, to yeah. had a he had a like a Mark II Escort, two litre Escort with the 
dual pedals and that sort of thing. Ah, fantastic. Yeah. I was only very young then, but yeah, it was uh, quite a funny looking, you know, looking at the, the dual pedals and how they did it, which was pretty, you know, tech screwed stuff to the floor and, and whatnot. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't, quite rudimentary. It wasn't, yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty rough, but because uh, I was wondering what your folks would have done, so old boy went and did, yeah, he did driving yeah. school. Yeah, well, he worked at it. He worked as a car salesman for a little while, and, yeah. then, and then decided he wanted to do the driving school. So he bought the the Escort new from Ford. So he worked for Ford. Must he? Been, yeah, he must have been like seventy eight or something like that, seventy nine, and uh, yeah, did that. I don't can't remember how long that was for, but. Mm. Uh, yeah, they had all sorts of jobs. My mum was a bean picker, so obviously not the best paying job and very difficult, but uh, I used to go to the bean patch with her and uh, just three years old and they she'd be picking beans with another mum and me and the other the kid who is still my good mate now after you know, 45 years. We'd just be running amok, three years old, all over the farm and uh, just doing whatever, just keeping keeping amused, that sort of thing. That's pretty wild. Yeah. And the fact that you mate – so from – so somebody that you've – yeah, so you've literally yeah. grown up with yeah. <laughs> from three, the bean farm. We were three years old, we met at the bean patch when, yeah. when our parents were working there and, yeah, we're still mates now. So. That's yeah. terrific. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, okay. So it was really just a getting like your mum and dad were just getting it done, weren't they? That was yeah, they were just. Cause and have you got brothers, sort of battlers, sisters? I suppose? Is battlers. The right, it sounds right sounds word like for bloody it. battling, I mean, mate. I think everyone was a battler in the seventies. It's or, part of the you know, the rules. Prior to recent times, yeah, everyone was doing it pretty tough. It was pretty basic. Everyone was. You know, that's all we knew. Basic existence: sausages and and veg. <laughs> Mate. That sort of thing. Eating three veg. That's yeah. the uh, that's it. That's the staple. Um, yeah, brothers and sisters. Yeah, I've got. Uh, I'm the youngest, and I've got two brothers and a sister. Uh, and did they think that you got away with murder? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think I did. I'm I was sure you did. Very. Uh, uh, I just did. I didn't know any difference. So I just did whatever until I got in trouble. But, mm. Yeah. Yes, as the eldest of three boys, I, as the trailblazer, I certainly think that the uh, the younger ones had an easier run yeah. through. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's it's definitely the case. The, the parents are just like... They're like, oh, well, I don't care. I'm going to care anymore. <laughs> yeah, like these, these idiots survived. It, it, <laughs> yeah, they'll be fucking fine, whatever. Yeah, we, we all survived. Had a bit of meat off us every now and then, but we were right. That does tend to happen. Now, yeah. mate, you said, so school was of very little interest... Yeah, I wasn't bad at school. I was just uh, in my teenage years. I just was very lazy, so uh, that's it, kind of a regret for me. But uh, how so? Oh, I just seeing my my son as my oldest son was very good at school, and and we were kind of hard on well, not hard on him, just very much encouraged him not to be lazy because that's what happened to me. I wasn't I wasn't stupid. I was just thinking about skirt and and parties and stuff like that instead of school so um it's kind of one of those things that you you in later life regret not actually just giving it a go and, and achieving something so but uh yeah I, I didn't really want to do anything but be a mechanic anyway i sort of worked yeah. that out in my probably my early teens like i was always pulling push bikes apart and rebuilding them and all that sort of stuff and did the other kids bring them around to you to sort them out? Did you get a bit of that too? Oh, there was none of that because we all lived so far away from each other. <laughs> Bloody three day ride to get to the neighbours joint. Yeah, that's it. We used we did used to ride our BMXs a long way to each other's houses, but uh, yeah, no, I never pulled them apart for other people. But yeah, right. uh, did a lots for lots of ourselves. DIY. You just enjoyed. Yeah, I just love pulling things apart and fixing them and modifying them, whatever. And my dad did that as well because we had all shitty cars and we, you just fix, you just had to fix them because that's what you – that was the, the way you got to uh, work. <laughs> so s- spent a lot of time as a youngster watching him pulling apart old Toyota Coronas and and uh, what else did we have? Toyota Crowns, just anything that was like 
absolutely worthless at the time. That's what we, we drove because they still got there and you could buy them for nothing. And you could buy six others for nothing as well and have plenty of spares. Have a spare, <laughs> spares and it was, it was a farm. So farms always have like, you know, cars and mm. tractors and shit lined up out the back. It's just, the rules. Just, yeah, never sell anything no. sort of scenario. That's but you <laughs> never know when you're going to need it. It's like yeah. that block of wood in the garage. That's it. That's it. So, yeah, so I knew from a young age that, that that's what I wanted to be. It was a mechanic and, and it still is. So that's, uh, I guess that's a good thing, knowing what you want and and pursuing it. It's uh, it's special when you figure that bit out. Yeah, it is. It's... Uh, at least you got something to somewhere to to get to head for, I suppose. Like, yeah, you know. to focus your attention. That and obviously, everything changes as your life goes on, but that uh, it's still got the same. I think oh, the, the biggest problem with I don't know if it's just me, but I still feel like I'm 16. Always have like you never get old. Like everything else, everything around you gets old, but you still think in your head that you're still a 16 year old. You know, mumping around with your Datsun. Honestly, I have noticed that that seems to be the norm. I remember talking to my grandfather in his mid eighties, and yeah, mate, he was a bloody teenager stuck in an old man's yeah. body. I know that I'm a reckless teenager stuck in a middle aged man's body. It it just seems to. I think it's a good way of not growing old. I think so. Mentally, I suppose I'd call it. Well, the the, the process of, exi- of existence can certainly uh, wear you down. So if you at least do maintain sort of a uh, childish mischiefness to you, I think that that actually brings a lot of good. Yeah, you can value the little things, I suppose. Like when you're a kid, like, like some little things that, don't mean anything really, but you, it does mean a lot to you as a, as a little kid, I suppose. And I suppose that's why we have cars. Like this. Technically, their only job is to get you from A to B, but that's not really how it works, is it? That's not, that's not even close. Yeah. No, there's, there's two categories of people. There's the people that are the A to B. And then there's us. And then there's us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and That's there is it. something wrong. As I have said to many of my friends, I believe I was dropped on my head as a child. Uh, that would at least help to explain some of the choices that I make. Yeah, well, we didn't have helmets or anything back in, mm. when I was a kid. So uh, there definitely probably was some brain injuries. So the stack hat wasn't a thing? The that was, stack hat was uh, very late in my... Late in the so game for When you. I was in the, my teens, probably. Mm. And no one, no one wanted to wear them. Even if you, well, we didn't, we didn't even have one. But even if you did have one, no one would. No, <laughs> we was, wouldn't wear them. Oh, I was fiercely it's uncool. Flat out getting us to wear shoes. We were that sort of kid that you go to school with your shoes on and take them off because your mum makes you. But the the school never made us, so we just took our shoes off and we really? just gone running around with no shoes on. Nice work. Yeah, it was good fun. Bloody classic. So, sunny coast. Of all the places you could move when you're leaving Gimpy, how did you narrow down whether you were going to go north, south, east? Um, so, I did a well, pre-vacational course. Mm. Well, I don't know if that's what it's still called, but it's basically a, a first half of your first year of apprenticeship and sort of preparing you to, to be a useful employee or start an apprenticeship. And uh, I sort of kind of got like headhunted, I suppose, by the by a training agency that, which was a kind of a new thing back then. Mm. Uh, like uh, I can't remember what they call them now, but like an apprenticeship agency. So, yeah. So the they sort of rent you out to the appropriate business or whatever, and then if you if you're if you're a shit, they could mm. hand you back and get another one. Mate, a uh, pimp, I believe they. they <laughs> <laughs> that's, maybe that's what it what it was, yeah, and I didn't the, realise. It was a giant felt hat that uh, you went. Mm, it's a bit a bit weird, but cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it could have been that. <laughs> it was pretty smooth. Now that I think uh, about it. Yeah, you were, oh, yeah. hang on a second. <laughs> so they, yeah, they had positions. It was it was a Sunshine Coast based company, and they had positions uh, down there. So I was like, if I wanted to get a 
get an apprenticeship. That's what I had to do. So I just, uh, you know, took my Datsun and went to the, I think it was Karamundi, Caloundra area was the first place I was posted at for a little while. And uh, then I ended up at a dealership in Nambour, which uh, was Volkswagen, Subaru and uh, Holden. We did, they didn't sell Holdens, but it was like a, a satellite yeah, service so agency. Because uh, what year would this have been? Because I'm trying to think Nine, with Volkswagen as well. Four? Yeah, so, it's so a bit, there was bit later. Then. No Volkswagens back then. Nothing no, that's like, what I'm, I'm like. Nothing like they are now. They were just, yeah, you'd sell like one or one, two. Yeah. Uh, Mark three Golfs. Yeah, I was trying to remember where they would have been up to uh, by then. <laughs> that was about all they had. And then we had heaps of like uh, combis. Oh, the, oh, yeah. The 80s combis, the, the water cooled engine. Heaps of them because that, that was kind of like a farm ute. Mm. And there was a lot of. Um, like Germans and uh, Europeans in that area. Yeah, and gotcha. The the owner of the dealership was of German descent, like he was an immigrant. Um, so there was a lot of yeah German descent people hanging around, and they all had Volkswagens and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, we 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 would work on like seventies Beetles and all, all sorts of stuff. It was quite a it wasn't your normal dealership. Uh, definitely nothing like what a dealership is nowadays. Uh, so we did work on. Yeah, like sometimes you'd have a combi and and then you'd have a brand new Holden, like a V8 police car, because we did uh, like fleet work on. It was mostly just Holden fleet stuff for uh, government. So all the cop cars and the, those ambulances that they stretched a Commodore Ute and put a big thing on the back of it which was the worst vehicle in the world i don't know how how they didn't crash those things more they did used to crash them a fair bit but yeah so we had all sorts of it was very different and i think of course subaru which was the the premium sort of vehicle then that they were a very high quality sort of vehicle compared to uh holden's no offence to Holden people, but they just were better built. You would have had the mighty Brumby and you were getting very yeah. close to Impreza time. Absolutely. Tons of Brumbies. They were still relatively new. Um, and they're still a weapon today. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they've, they've done some work, those things. Oh, well, we had yeah, st- even 70s ones. Like, people just kept driving them and because they were only 20 years old then. So, yeah, and lots of Liberties. So they were selling like hotcakes and, uh, and the WRX came in about that time but mm. they were quite expensive at the time and RS Turbo Liberties as well they were they were also they were, they were, I think they were nearly double the price of an SS Commodore so it was it was sort of um, you had to be usually you're a doctor or something if you had one of them <laughs> but or your farm mm. grew other things yeah so. <laughs> oh, actually there was a lot of rich uh, cane farmers around there too yeah, at the time amazing back in the day the amazing how that happened generational wealth there was, yeah. was quite quite a bit quite a bit of that going on yeah cuz yeah good good little part of australia there i mean karamundi and up in Nambour, that's that's good yeah. country in there yeah and yeah. you didn't get called to the beach you didn't grow your hair down to your shoulders and go no, surfing no never got into surfing eh? A lot of friends of mine do, but it wasn't really a thing. Didn't speak to you? No. I was You're just too busy. Too busy with well, cars. working on cars. That's all I ever did. Because you know? there was an important detail that we missed. You drove your Datto down. What sort of Datto? Uh, at that time, it was a 1600 or 510. Oh, yeah. That was my second car. Uh, my first car was a Datsun 1000, uh, which I both of them I built, like, restored. And I'm... Uh, <laughs> I'm doing italics because they are restored as well as a 17-year-old can restore a, a, a 1960s Datsun. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I was a bit of a Datsun fanatic back then. Always loved them. My Datto 1600 was the king. Yeah, that w- they were the king vehicle back then. I, I, I did like it. It was a good, good handling thing that you could chuck together with junk from the wreckers, which I did. And uh, it never let me down, that thing. It was a pretty cool car. Yeah. They're an incredible car. Now they're worth a lot of money. They're worth a billion dollars <laughs> now. <whereas laughs> and I'm not surprised because they were pretty much worn out back back in the 90s and 
that's a, a long way past that now. So someone's had to tip a lot of money into them in the meantime to make them not a rusted out wreck. So and most of the good ones had SR twenties chucked into them as well. Yeah, in the uh, well, it was FJ twenties in my in my day. That was the uh, that, that was the that was the mod. Yeah, that was the the uh, was that was God's engine for a. A uh, Japanese car enthusiast <laughs> like myself. Well, see, back in my day, yeah, that it was the SR. Yeah, that, I, okay. I was that transition. It's a generational thing. It is a generational thing. I was a bit more hot fours, I guess. So a couple of years later than you. Yeah, I was in hot. I was into hot fours and fast fours. That was like yeah, that was the nineties. Yeah. Mate, that was the Bible. but it wasn't like uh, auto selling stuff back then. It was no. actual just datos and RX twos and correct RX threes and more datos and. R100s and more datos and the odd Corolla, I guess. And a Pulsar ET Turbo. Yeah. Or a Sigma or, you know, real. Yeah. Oh, and Geminis. I'm yeah. still trying oh, to figure out where the fuck are all the thousands Geminis? Thousands of Geminis. Where yeah. are they now? I there don't. There must be some still around. Went, but mate, I reckon that they've all run away and they're all hiding somewhere because those bloody things used to be everywhere yeah. and they've all just disappeared. They built them to 85 as well, so it's got a. Mate, I'm that's, a, that's got a that's a lot longer than a, a Datsun 1600 is only built to like 73 or something. So you'd see them uh, everywhere, so, yeah? and a, now they're invisible, and I am very confused. And I think that there's something going. They're on. in people's sheds for sure. Yeah, like you don't take stuff like that out. You, it's uh, <laughs> they're worth too much now. Yeah, that's what car shows are for. Hey, you just turn up at a cars and coffee or whatever, and you're like, where the. Fuck all these cars come from where did this come from yeah people have got them hidden yeah. away little, little things kept quietly so you're living on the sunny coast you've moved to Nambour working as an apprentice yeah the German owned dealership what was that experience like working on Euro cars the Japanese cars the and again the Subarus Yes, it was. Well, it was pretty yeah. awesome. Like, I, yeah, the Subaru thing was a bit of an eye opener for me because they were just so well made. The particularly back in the the first of those uh, like Gen One Liberties, they basically just chucked everything at them and went from those wonky Leones and Brumbies into this sort of like it was light years ahead of the. Suspension and design and that sort of thing. It was it was a real car, like a a world class sort of thing. Whereas that before they had a Brumby, like it was just like how they do, how did they do this? <laughs> That's a big change in in company sort of uh, direction, really. Like to go from a sort of odd looking sort of half farm vehicle with four wheel drive that only only works half the time and it's at the wrong end, and, and so. Yeah, I thought they were a pretty impressive thing, and uh, yeah, obviously the RS Turbo was the was the big deal, and I did end up buying an RS Turbo years later, which I, which was a really cool car. Love one of them as well, but again, they they're crazy money, same as early WRX. So also uh, probably hard cool. to get because it, they got, all got wrecked. They were <laughs> thrashed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a bit of fun. Yeah, I did. I did enjoy the. The you know the difference of you know your V8 Commodore and then and then your Subaru and then then we had uh, VR6 Golfs they were cool uh, the first ones of those as well but yeah again usually a doctor owned one of those at the time because you had to have a fair old income to afford something like that but, um, and the other side of the whole apprenticeship thing was there was also a steering and suspension shop that was owned by the same owner and they were joined, they were next to each other and it was like something from the 50s. Uh, that's how long it had been there. So you'd, you, I'd work over there periodically for, you know, certain amounts of time. You sort of moved around and to give you a better experience of the different types of cars and what you could expect to be up against. So be over there doing EH Kingpin reaming and tons of wheel alignments and rebuilding steering racks and pumps and stuff like that and then uh, uh, you know you walk through the the alleyway to the dealership and you're working on brand new commodores and and 
Subarus and stuff like that. So it was kind of, it was very, it was a pretty unique sort of experience as far as doing an apprenticeship. So I guess it probably did shape me a bit as far as learning, being able to learn different things and still work on old cars and new cars and, and all that sort of stuff. So it's kind of cool. Was the dealership training pretty serious back then, particularly with the international manufacturers? Were they fairly rigorous or was it pretty no, nice? Not really. It, it, the whole it was it was a very family run business and and the it was it was small really like it was I don't know maybe there was thirty people working there uh, five six mechanics and you know the parts and salesmen and that sort of thing so it was a pretty small place very um, <laughs> it wasn't like a big you know big spendy money dealership it was it was a like a small business more, more so and uh, sort of very closely run by the, the owner and um, full disclosure, the, own, the, the, the dealer principal is my father-in-law because I ended up marrying his daughter. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, she worked there a couple of years after I started. She moved back from Brisbane and uh, was working as an admin in the office and, and uh, yeah, the rest is history, as they say. Well, that's but, it. Uh, he would have gone, this dirty dog <laughs> spins spanners. He's like, for fuck's sake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was quite the achievement, you know. Oh, at, bloody at, bet it was, mate. At the time, bagging the, the oh. uh, dealer principal's <laughs> door. Oh, oh <laughs> mate, I'm just, again, knowing the power dynamic of a dealership. That's, yeah. uh, oh, crikey. Anyway, <laughs> there's a good story there. Yeah, that's it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so it was good fun. So you spent some years heaps. there. Like you were obviously there for a reasonable yeah, duration of time. Uh, five, maybe six years, I suppose. Just after he, uh, he, he retired, the, my father-in-law, and then was bought out by a, a big dealership and obviously everything changes once that happens and, and yeah, a lot of people moved on and... and I was one of them eventually after, I don't know, six or eight months I moved on to uh, another workshop which was opened by one of my workmates in the steering shop. So he went out on his own once the the dealership was sold and that business as well and uh, I ended up working there as well doing you know, steering and that sort of stuff and wheel alignments and stuff like that. So, yeah, sort of got around a bit at that time. And because uh, where are we up to in time here? Is this late nineties? Ninety nine. It was sold. Yeah. So um, late nineties, bang into Y two K. Yeah, yeah. I do recall the mm. freaking out about Mate, the, the world was going to crash. Night. I was, I, I was waiting for everything to stop. Yeah, I didn't know enough about computers to worry about it. So. I knew a lot about computers, <laughs> and I was like, "Fuck, we're fucked." And then nothing happened. And nothing happened. Yeah. Yeah. So. So it was that a bit disappointing. Yeah, it was really disappointing, mate. I was like, <laughs> ready. It would have been heaps interesting if yeah. it had happened. I was ready to throw down. I was, I don't know. But, yeah, nothing happened. Uh, so, yeah, so you're right at the, yeah, so again, turn of the, turn of the century, mate. Doesn't that make it sound old? Mm. So in the turn of the century, uh, Alan, <laughs> <laughs> you were working at a steering, so he went out of his own as a steering shop. Was that yep. sort of what he did? Yeah, there? so it was... Mainly it was general mechanical, but mm. focused on yes, he did it's a specialty steering box rebuilds, uh, steering rack and that sort of thing. So, and wheel alignment, uh, suspension stuff. So, we did a lot of a lot of wheel alignments, like thousands of them, uh, pretty much all day long. So, and this was still Sunny Coast Nambour. This was Palmwood, so mm. bit hinter not far, yeah, Just a bit hinterlandy. Mate, how good's Palmwoods? Yeah, how, good's, how good's that little road too? Just quite <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, banger. What's that called? Hunt, Hunt yeah. Road or something? Something. And then there's that fantastic pub up the top. Palm oh, that's yeah. Palmwoods. Uh, ah, yeah. the, the pub and Rick's Garage. Rick's the, Garage. That's, that's the, 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 the car themed. So when I worked there, that was a service station, mm. and it was yeah. Palmwoods, an operating service station that was ancient, and you know, you'd go at the back, and there'd be like oil drums. Dribbling down the footpath and that sort of thing, like a proper old servo. So yeah, old it's pretty amazing that they converted it into what it is now. Because having seen it, 
prior to that, <laughs> you wouldn't think it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how many years up there in Palmwoods? I think I was there for about 18 months and then I just wanted to do something else. And were you living with the dealer principal's daughter at that point or were you still yeah. wooing? Yeah. Yeah, we were. So she came we, with you to Palmwoods? We'd bought a house by then. So Really? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was there for, oh, yeah, fair well, 18 months. Mm. It was a good stint. And then for some reason I wanted to get back into a dealership and I did. Really? And then it was horrible. Yes. It was like... It wasn't like what what my version of a dealership was, so I didn't no, like, it didn't last long there. I was going to say that's a special kind of madness. Uh, what what was? Can you? That was uh, Gary Crick. So they'd end up buying. In the meantime, the they'd end up with Subaru somehow. I can't remember how. Obviously, dealership things that people, <laughs> you know what. They, you know what dealerships are like? They try and buy everything and then go broke and then they have to sell everything and then someone else comes in and they all, you know, it's a bit dog eat dog with the, the dealership sort of side of things. So they ended up with Subaru um, and they still have it now. But yeah, it was, I worked there for a little bit as a Subaru guy and I just didn't like the the vibe. Uh, so I got out of there and then ended up at a little satellite dealership for Mazda, actually. So it was a bit of a change. Uh, and that was a cool place because I was working there with my mate, Miles, who I ended up going into business with years later, in just, just the two of us. So all we had to do is do all the work that we had for the day. Uh, there was no one else there, just the two of us in the shed. And then we just did whatever. So we were, we'd play PlayStation and or whatever and then fix our cars or just do whatever we wanted to do. So it was pretty awesome. Uh, so I was there for quite a while actually doing that. And then I ended up going to a Subaru specialist and worked there for many years, uh, which was a wrecking yard, but it was a bit more than that. They they had specialty workshop and I was like the guy. So I, there I could do whatever I wanted with Subaru stuff because it was – there was just thousands of them. There was so much stuff there. If I wanted to know how something worked, I just went out and pulled it apart, smashed it, had a look, found out how it worked, then go and get another one. Like there was – you, you're able to learn because there was no risk, uh, like a lot less risk involved because there was – you had the backup of, of a wrecking yard full of, of cars. You can go and get another one if you if you buggered something up. So Which is fantastic. Yeah, so that was that was a great place to work for – I was right into Subarus by then. Clearly, uh, very, very heavily into the, into mucking around with them. And I ended up starting to do engine conversions there because the whole half cut thing was, was a thing by then. So that was kicking off. They were, you know, cutting cutting in half, ten year old WRXs and uh, sending them over for a couple of grand. We. By the time they got here, we were paying a couple of grand for them. So I can't imagine – they must have been practically free in Japan by the time you do the work over there, stick it in a must container, been, send yeah. it over. They're and probably then, one dollar. And then like, make make mm. profit over here. Like, So that was that was pretty awesome actually. And the stuff that they used to send over, like like RA version, uh, like early like Liberty legacies. Mm. So stuff now that would be worth a lot of money because they were – like a homologation rally car thing back then, and they'd just chop them in half, <laughs> send them to Australia, and then I'd pull the engines out of them and stick them in on an Australian car and change all the wiring over, and then, yeah, it was, uh, make the RS into a weapon and yeah, well, just take normal the base liberties. model things. Yeah, because there was not many RSs around, and they were quite expensive still, so it was just like normal liberties that we'd just, you know, get a GX, like, wind up Windows Liberty and just smack an RS, RA half cut in with <laughs> it's just they just was they were just worth nothing it was, it was now that I think about it because you'd be just like oh this has got like weird coloured tappet covers and a, a gold intercooler and some stuff written on it no I don't know looks alright must be cool stick it in and then later on you find out that it's like a 
homologation sort of like a rally homologation model <laughs> <laughs> and <sighs> further into the years we we would get lots of uh wrx versions of them as well like the light and uh they had they were like stripped out lot and cars with from factory like for for rallying and yeah they just chopped me in half and sent them yeah. to australia so well there was no value again you're you're old enough to remember when classic cars were something that just idiots did and there was no money in it yeah and stuff didn't appreciate it was they were just all shit yeah, boxes you just and poured, something you, you very, just poured your bank account yeah, into it and then there was it, something very wrong with people that collected and did up cars yeah. there was something wrong with them and we were just our own people and it wasn't something that you did to make money. Yeah, yeah. And that was, yeah, it, it made it a very cheap time. And again, this was around Fast and the Furious time and all the crazy things and then the Japanese scene and then yeah. drifting and the like the whole thing went fairly yeah, I think it really mental. took off in the 2000s. Oh, mate, oh. that scene and the Japanese cars, and it, it just spun out of control. Yeah. It, it, it became a mainstream thing. Yeah, it's, it's odd that, isn't it? Because it was such a poorly depicted movie, really. Oh, it was like the terrible. <laughs> but it was somehow but, so accurate. But it made people like cars, I suppose, that maybe never thought about it. Uh, I don't know. I guess and they the, did a good job in that regard. Oh, they did a great job. I had neons in my car. I was laughing at that the other day. I'm like, fuck, I had, I had, like neons up under the dash, zip tied and, <laughs> yeah. you know, wired back to the cigarette lighter. I, ne- I never got into anything oh, like that. So glorious. I, I, I will not comment. Oh, <laughs> mate, I was 21 when that <laughs> came out. So I was uh, a very impressionable young man. Yeah, it got me good. So following working there for years, I, that was my – foray into my own business, um, which I started with um, Miles, who was at the time, he was actually a service manager, so reasonably high up in the in the game at uh, the Gary Cricks, the big dealership, and um, we kind of worked on the weekends, like he, he would work all week and I would work all week, and then on the weekends we'd do engine conversions on, on Subaru's. So we had we found this little niche market which was the nineties liberties, like the Gen Two, they were called, that you couldn't buy one with a turbo. So they didn't sell them in in, in Australia with with turbo engines, but there was obviously tons of them in Japan. So all these young fellas had these cars and they all wanted to turbo them. So we would just do mostly just WRX engine conversions on them. And it was all Lego, you just pretty much just bolted it mm. in. But we, we had it so down pat that we were able to offer like a menu on our website or whatever it was. We were probably pretty primitive at the time, but yeah, you could tick tick the boxes. What do you do you want this extra bit here? And at the end of it just go, ching, this is how much it's gonna cost you. And people loved it because it was like, I know they knew exactly how much it was to get the things that they wanted and there was no variables like and we could guarantee that that's how much it was going to cost because we'd done it so much so we just we churned these things out it was like a factory and uh, sort of did pretty well out of it it was hard work like we put the hours in but, uh, yeah that was was quite cool like, people used to send their cars from melbourne sydney adelaide like on trucks and we'd build them and then they'd fly up and drive them home what was the business called? That was AM Auto, AM Auto Services, Alan Miles. So uh, yeah, that that started off in my shed, which is was ended up being called the Skid Factory, which was just a stupid nickname that one of my mates gave it, and we couldn't think of anything to name out the the show at, <laughs> at the time, so that was it. Uh, but yeah, we did that for a couple of years full time in in that shed, and then until we had the capital to go and get a proper factory unit sort of thing, which we did. And uh, then we were there for, well, I was in business with Miles there for eight years, I think. So I have, I, have, I think I'm figuring out that I've got like an eight year cycle here. Yeah, I was <laughs> so noticing. It seems like that I'd might be the case. But didn't want to point it out. <laughs> yeah, I went, there's a pattern here. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, we, we continued to do that at that 
uh, like at the new premises for years as well and then just general mechanical as well and then I started doing different cars like you know Skylines and Supras and again there was a lot of uh, non-turbo Supras that were cheap and people bought them and then went oh why have I got a non-turbo Supra when I can have a turbo one so again two JZs were like two thousand dollars GTE so we'd buy them and swap them in and then the gearbox would explode and then we'd swap in a proper gearbox and same with Skylines, you could buy an RB26 for a couple of grand uh, and we'd do them into into RB25 Skylines and that sort of thing. And Yeah, I just sort of started doing a lot more complex stuff and uh, got more heavily into wiring, which I was kind of self-taught with the Subaru side of things, how to, how to wire things and uh, got more and more into it and then aftermarket ECUs and that sort of thing. So it was a bit of a... It was, you know, it's like a, you learn, get bored, want, get, move on to something bigger, challenge yourself a bit more and yeah, it just continues like that and snowballs until you sort of somehow know how to wire up complex things without even thinking about it. Because so. the GDRs in particular, because you, you'd be talking R34s that you'd be pulling, because uh, you said RB26s and stuff. Yeah, they were usually R32. R32, yeah. so they were earlier. Pretty haggard. <laughs> <laughs> so not quite as sexy. Here I am oh. thinking you were getting lovely. Again. Like lovely RBs, but every, you were getting. I can't understand why people get so excited about the, the GDR because I was there when they were worthless and and I've driven them and, they're not that – they're not fast. I, th- I think they're, it's a wonderful thing that they built, but they weren't, really, they weren't really that fast. They kind of like weren't meant to be as a stock car. They were meant to be turned into a race car, which they were then fast, which is obviously what people do to them. But, yeah, they were – they weren't very real – they weren't respected as far as the car goes in Japan because the cars were they – were, they were all junk when they got they, – you know, they'd chop them in half and send them over here. And the, they were never looked after, and I think that was just the, the culture at the time in in Japan. Like that, excess was a thing. Like they were so, the economy was was, was so good that that the cars old. I don't want it anymore. They get a, I don't know, buy an R thirty four or something like that. So yeah, it's kind of the GDR thing is a bit. It's, it's very. It's pretty interesting because now people want them, but a lot of them got chopped in half and sent to Australia and then the big ends broke and, <laughs> and on and on and on, you know, like they they were very poorly looked after in, in general and a lot of them were, were already broken when they got when they got imported. So, yeah, it's an interesting time with the, in the 2000s again for imported cars because that's when we started seeing a lot of stuff like Sauras and, and all that, all that cool stuff come in and... They were cheap as well, and then people just didn't respect them because they were so cheap. And then now there's now you flat out seen a saw on the road because they all just got chopped up, and the engine and that one J pulled out of them, or the one Z or whatever, and and the rest left in the bushes or scrapped. So it's, it's kind of interesting how things go full circle like that. But Mate, it was people were still saying only milk and juice comes in two liters. <laughs> And all of your Japanese stuff, all the turbo stuff, people looked at them as kids' cars and boy races and, like, you were just a bit of a tosser Yeah. if you drove that sort of thing. There was zero respect, zero credibility and it only made sense within that scene. Yeah. I must have been in that scene then because I thought every all those cars were awesome. Like, I mean, obviously everything's got its faults but uh, stuff like... To drive a 1JZ-powered Sora back in 2000 when it was maybe not even 10 years old, I, I, I drove one that had like 20,000 Ks on it and I was like, I can't believe it. This is the the best car I've ever driven in my life. It was unbelievable to drive. Like the, the engine was magnificent. Like how's this thing a 2.5 litre? It was just the smoothest, nicest thing and obviously big luxury car so it was bloody nice to drive. I was like, this... I, I can't look at an Australian car anymore. Like, it's, this is just so much better. Like, why don't we have cars like this? And then, of course, they all started flooding in. And uh, most of them weren't that good. Like, 
I will say that because a lot of them were crashed and bought in and repaired and every single one of them was green. That was obviously what, a very popular colour in the what 90s. What was it with that? The sauras and green. Yeah, they're all that metallic, like darkish green colour. And they even used to repaint them in Australia because there was like 50 green ones for sale. So they'd chuck a coat of paint on them just to make it a different colour so they could go, hey, this is a red one. And then not, you'd buy that instead because you don't want to have the same colour as all your mates saw us because they're all green. So, yeah. My younger cool. brother had one and I still remember when I drove it for the first time and just going, holy shit. Like, they, when you put your yeah, foot they, into they it, they went they, slow. Yeah. They pretty much did everything quite well. They knew how to boogie. Yeah, yeah. And they were a lovely car. As you said, you got and in it's them. it's a big car too. It was like, fancy and beautiful. Yeah. Just yeah. did everything well. Yeah, so I see. Seen quite a lot of cool imported stuff back then. Um, there was an imported, uh, like a guy that sold imported uh, cars in the street that I worked in and we did the road with this for him. So I get to drive all these, all sorts of stuff. And I was like, oh, this is, this is the best thing ever. I get to drive around in like, you name it, mostly Supras and Sloras and that sort of thing. I can't remember what else they imported. I also had a mate who's still a very good mate now that was just obsessed with buying every single import and he, he must have had like 50 cars because he had GDRs, GDIRs, Sauras, Supras. He would get a new car every three weeks, I reckon, back in the day. And so we got to drive all of them. Yeah, it was like that was that was my life back then was just like how cool are these cars? Like look at this GDIR. What, what were they thinking? Like look how complicated and cool this little tiny hatchback thing is and they weren't a very good car but they were cool to look at they were great and they, now and now they're like unobtainium because well they are because same thing they were just buckets of shit yeah with an SR20 just wrecked them and blew the gearbox up and sideways and yeah hard launched an all-wheel drive yeah. car and yeah he did that as well yeah i remember trying to get the gearbox out it was a nightmare so yeah, anything that's hard to work on ends up in the bin because you because they can't afford to fix it. Because it's like, oh, that's going to cost you $10,000 to fix that gearbox. And you're like, I only paid that for the car. There you go. Ends up in the, in a paddock with grass ground to it. Absolutely. Yes. So that was a good time. You'd move those along. So where are we up to in uh, in sequential order here? We're, we're mid-late OOs here, I'm feeling. Uh, I think we started the... Business in the new premises in 08. Yeah, because my second son was just about to be born. So, yeah. So, that went through to like 16, I suppose. No, 17. No, it was longer than I thought. Yeah. So, that's a slightly longer stint there, mate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> new, old, new record. Uh, I, yeah. And, well, during that time, I also started to learn fabrication more. Uh, was that because you got bored again and just went? I don't know. I just, I could, half of it is just like you, you pay someone to do something and it's just like, that's not, you didn't do it right. And then it's like, I, I'm, I might as well just do it myself. Do it myself. And if I, if I, if it's not good enough, it's my fault. So you set your own standards. So I just would just buy a welder. I'd been doing stainless steel fabrication for, for many years. Again, just because I wanted to, and like it was of, of interest to me, so I then moved on to, to, to aluminium, which is a lot harder than stainless steel and um, custom engine mounting and putting engines in cars. That, you know, like you can put a two JZ in a Supra because that's what it had. You didn't, don't have to do anything; you just plonk, plonk it in there on its mount. So you put your WRX engine in Liberty because it just bolts in. So then we started moving into doing things that were not meant to be in there, mm. um, you know, putting 2JZs into mm. everything because 2JZs were free, like mm. practically free back then. Which sounds ridiculous nowadays. It's very <laughs> hard to explain to people. Yeah, as soon as we found out about Aristos and that they also had the same engine as a Supra. You're and like, yeah, buddy, you're like oh, half cut cool. every single <laughs> yeah. one, please, and yeah. thank you. And there was a lot of them around. There was a lot of, of those sort of luxury versions of, of cars 
that uh, like we didn't really have that greater knowledge of what was sold in Japan back then, like we do now. You know, we didn't know about like chasers and stuff like that. Had one JZs in them because you never seen them. You didn't. But yeah, then exactly. you get a half cut. And it's like, oh, why is the sump at the this? other end? Why is mm. the well at the front and not at the back? And because there's no panels on them, really, so you don't really know. I'm like, what, what is this thing? Like? What is or was this? Yeah, that's it. So yeah, kind of, kind of had to piece things together with just observing half cuts and what what they look like and that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, so I was also friends with with Benny, uh, who's also on Mighty Car Mods so as guest quite often from has a, his own YouTube channel now. And he worked at an at a an actual importer. So he and he was also obsessed with Subarus and Japanese cars like I am. So he he found out a lot of stuff that w- that I couldn't find out about different models and that sort of thing and and where they came from and however how many thousand different bloody Nissans there are. They got the same chassis with a different body on top of them and that sort of thing. So yeah, that's cool. It's a good time. Sounds like a bloody good time. I miss those times. It was like, simple. Feels simple like a, times. Feels like I squandered the. The uh, the two JZs, <laughs> yeah. But again, who was to know? I mean, I still yeah. remember when nine elevens were a piece of shit That's that nobody right. wanted. <laughs> who wants that Volkswagen? Yeah, who wants that fucking <laughs> hunk of shit? Yeah, do I look like I have a ponytail yeah. and I'm a big fuckwit? Like they just weren't a thing. Yeah. Whereas and now, also no one could afford to rebuild the engine. No, no, and could. the engines were always broken. So. Yeah. yeah, they were just big. I don't think anyone can afford to rebuild them now. No, they can't, mate. They just a, don't drive them. What a specialist thing. It really is and the people only discover that after they buy them usually and they discover IMS bearings and all sorts of fun yeah. things if anyone anyway, wants to chuck it. away their 911 just give me a call yeah I'll, I'll, I'll sort that out for you I've been trying to buy one off a friend's dad since the 90s <laughs> <sighs> it's not going well could have played the long game right yeah it's still not going well he's kept track of what it's worth unfortunately <laughs> so. yeah see that's the problem with the internet it's like yeah it's not working for me even us old folk know how they how it works and hey. find out how much things are going for fuck goddamn marketplace yeah mate that's worth 20 <laughs> grand i'm sorry no, yeah. nobody wants those big bags of shit yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're around the year 2017 are we yes and what's happening then um two kids by 2017 or is this... Oh, yeah, I had two two kids by 2008. So, so 05 and 08, they were born. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, obviously the oldest is is an adult now, uh, italics. He's, in the eyes of the law, he's an adult. In my eyes, he's still a... He's got a way to go. ...derpy kid that does really stupid things to his car and then I have to fix them. But that's I'm sure that's a very common... Um, Story for a parent. Who, who would have thought, mate? Young bloke doing stupid things to a car. Yeah, I never did that. No, never. No, you did it really well. My my dad never had to fix things that I wrecked. No, no, <laughs> it's always great care and the expertise yeah. of a man doing. I it just knew things. everything straight away. That's that's what well, I, that's what I recall. From, you do. As an eighteen year old, I remember knowing a lot more than my dad. I remember that I had it figured out, <laughs> and he was just a big idiot. Yeah. <sighs> I've since apologised. <laughs> <laughs> Your boy's got a few more years to go, yeah, unfortunately. He'll figure it out. <laughs> Only a few more stupid things to do. Ah. So, yes, so the kids were well and truly grown up. but Well, not grown up, though. Yeah, bigger. <laughs> yeah, they could wipe their bums. That's, so a, that's the moment. So, yeah, I think the thing that – what happened was we – Decided that we're going to go do a lap of Australia before the kids got too old, and that uh, that happened in 2016. So we bought a caravan and a soccer mum Pajero and did the did the lap, and uh, it kind of changed my sort of view of what I what I wanted to do as far as life and work and stuff like that. So I decided I wanted to get out of the the eight to five business and just work for myself at home, just doing the things that I know how to do well, which is, you know, shoving engines in cars and that sort of thing. So I um, left the, the AM Auto business with Miles and he, he still runs it now um, and just 
started working at home again because I, I had the, the shed since 05. So I had all the, the infrastructure there just doing, basically doing nothing. We used to, used to do a bit of like mates work on the weekends and stuff and throw, do a bit of car work, but it was just basically sitting around doing nothing. So I just uh, sort of put it back into, into use and set up a workshop there and then just started doing work for myself under the, the name Alloyed Performance, which is a play on Al Hyde, and my wife's name's Heidi. So we had to, we had to come up with a name real quick. So I threw, threw a few <laughs> names around and that's what we came up with. So yeah, so I started doing that for, I did that for about a year. And then in the meantime, we, was, we were working on the, uh, like the Skid Factory project sort of thing which was kind of, my recollection was it was Marty Mulholland's idea, so Marty from MCM. He, he basically said, oh, you guys, you, you do real cool stuff, you should film it. And uh, I could, you know, get a YouTube channel. So I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. I'm like, not exactly the, well, especially at the time, I wasn't the greatest uh, public speaker, so uh, it was going to be interesting. But uh, Woody... At the time, was working in a bottle shop because he he figured out early that being a, a mechanic wasn't an easy job, and it's probably probably better ways to go about your life if 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 you're not like passionate about it like I was. So he started working in a bottle shop, and and uh, he was interested in sort of uh, you know editing, filming. He, he learned all that stuff in school because he's you know because he was so young. They learnt that sort of stuff in school which, uh, that didn't exist when I was that age. So he, uh, I roped my mate in. This is the previous mate that, that had owned like 50 imported cars. I'm not even joking, that many. Uh, he had a fair lane and uh, it had a stock 302 in it. So I kind of talked him into it, which is not that hard, um, into doing a build on it and putting a Toyota V8 in it. With a turbo, so uh, that's the build that we did first, and yeah, we did we did it from start start to to finish in italics, uh, and kind of filmed it all the way through, and then and then all the editing was done. I can't remember whether he did it at the time or whether it was all done afterwards, but uh, he kind of crash coursed his way through editing with the help from Marty, and. Uh, then we kind of just released it on their channel or their second channel, MCM TV2, and got an instant audience. So we kind of, I don't know, I think we cheated a bit as far as YouTube audiences go because people already knew who I was from being on MCM and then we were on MCM's second channel. So it was like that was a 600,000 subscriber channel uh, that they didn't really use that much at the time and I don't think they still do, but... Uh, yeah, so we cheated and got an instant audience and then we did that for on that channel for 18 months and basically yeah, just anything that came in the door, I was just like, oh, this this will, this will be cool, let's just build this and whoever, whoever was ready to do something, let's do it. And managed to make it sort of educational slash entertaining at the same time and, uh, yeah, the rest is kind of history, I suppose. Well, that's the thing. How did you commercialise this? I mean, how were you... Paying your bills. Yeah, so originally I was still working uh, as Allied, uh, d building cars, various vehicles, at the same time. So I'd be doing that and then be working on the fair lane as well, just sort of one – I had two hoists by then, so we'd sort of have, have a, you know, like a customer on one side and the fair lane on the other and – uh, Woody worked weird hours because he was at a bottle shop, so uh, like he'd start work at like three o'clock in the Arvo or something like that. So we'd sort of just work our way through it, and I'd do customer work, and then I'd do work on the fair lane, and then he'd go to work at, and go to the bottle load of work at night, and we kind of just worked it out somehow. Like we were just, I don't know, it, it was just a, it was a, a a hobby experiment sort of thing at the time, which. Which obviously makes it fun, and we just bumbled our way through it and tried to figure out how to speak in front of a camera and how to lay out 
uh, you know, an episode or whatever, which obviously is not as easy as you'd, you'd think. But uh, got guidance from the MCM guys, of course, and then just, I don't know, just worked out as we went. And, and because it took off, it, that's like the biggest encouragement you can get, really. It's like people actually like it. And the feedback was pretty good uh, on, you know, comment section feedbacks and that sort of thing. So um, eventually, because we were sharing the income with MCM, because it was their channel, obviously, so we we were finding it difficult to make enough money to make it worthwhile. So eventually, they just said, "Look, you just got to have your own channel because th- there's no there's no other way of doing it." So from from Friday to Monday, we went from being on their channel to having our whole, whole new channel and they Marty set it all up for us because he obviously knows what he's doing but um, yeah so all of a sudden it was like oh we've got our own channel now by ourselves and uh, so then we had to build the audience which didn't take that much it was kind of people realised it pretty quick what was happening so we got to 100,000 subscribers pretty quick which was which is a yeah, big deal in, in our world, that was a big deal. Like 100,000 people wanted to watch us. So that, that's obviously... Mate, that's a big deal in <laughs> any world. Of, in, in anyone playing YouTube games, <laughs> yeah. that's a big deal. So we got the little... You know, Mate, you got the plaque, the, the big plaque, shiny. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, um, that's a big deal. So it was a slow growth after 100,000. And uh, I think it's 280 now. Uh, which you kind of get complacent about it a bit. Like it's like a... You know, someone else has got three million, blah blah blah. Like, but we, what we were doing, we 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 probably got about seventy, seventy five thousand, eighty thousand views for most episodes um, every week. So that's a pretty reasonable amount of people that are watching you and always want to watch you. So it's. Uh, I mean, Blair always put it to me with Moog as, do you know how many people watch the news? It's like, it's not, it's n- it's nowhere near that many people. Like, people, not many people watch commercial TV. More people are watching your, you bumbling around in a shed, throwing engines in cars that shouldn't be in there than they are watching commercial TV. So it's kind of like, if you put it in that context, it, it, it makes a bit more sense as far as the achievement. Uh, so we just kept going. And I just did whatever would interest me because I figured if if I'm interested in it, then most car guys are probably going to be going to be interested in it. So most of it was just building a car that I thought was cool, putting an engine in it that I thought was cool, doing stuff that and and also a lot of the time it was for mates of ours or they they would start off as. The Hakasuka guy was just a random guy that I'd never met, but now now we're good mates because we went through this whole process with him. And I did that car because it was a cool car. Like it's like there's not not many cars cooler than a, like a Hakasuka or Hakasuka, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so yeah, um, I enjoyed the the builds. Like that's what I like doing, and. Uh, Unfortunately, it gets less and less of the thing that you enjoy and more and more of the business side of things or of, you know, this is our sole income, we've got to run a merch store, we've got to do socials, we've got to do all this stuff and it's like the percentage of you actually doing a thing that you like gets less and less and less over time and, and you, that's probably what where I ended up going, oh, I don't think, I, I think I'm having much fun doing this anymore. I'd, I'd, I'd rather just be doing cars in my shed and there's a level of frustration to the um, having to wait yeah the hurry up and wait thing um, because you got to film everything if if it's not on if it's not on film it never happened um, so I just want to put that thing on but I can't because it, it's got to be filmed and it might not it Moody might not be there or whatever you know so you, you kind of just oh god I just want to get this done and that that's like I like to get stuck in and, and get shit done and that couldn't happen a lot of the time so that sort of led to a bit of frustration on my part and so 
yeah, eventually I just was like, oh, I don't think I want to do this anymore. And it's, that's just a cycle, I suppose. Like, if you're not enjoying it, that was, I've kind of get to the age where I'm like, why am I doing this if I'm not really enjoying it anymore? Um, I have achieved something, which I'm very proud of. And it's also, obviously, as a very quiet person that I am, uh, it's sort of made me grow as a person as far as being able to talk about, to, to talk, to present. Uh, it's, you got to be, got to have a certain level of self-confidence for that, which I never really had any self-confidence. So I guess that part of that was building that self-confidence in myself that I could present, believe what I was saying, uh, you know, make it interesting, that sort of thing. So it was awesome until I didn't really want to do it anymore. And that's where we are now. So... <laughs> Take me back to those early days, though, because I could even hear the excitement that you talked about it as you, as it started to gain momentum, and obviously that's a big jump as you sort of go, oh, well, you know, we hit 100,000 pretty quickly. As a bloke that's made 300 videos in the last two years on a separate project, and I'm at 821 subscribers after two years and 300 videos, I would suggest that A, I'm not very good, and B, it's very hard. So that's a pretty – because, again, from somebody sitting where I am, my podcast has gone pretty hard. The numbers on that are a lot more exciting. But as somebody trying to build a YouTube channel, I've been told by people more recently that you've really got about three years is the grind to get from zero to a 1,000. That's the grind initially for just Joe Average. And, yeah, like I said before, I think we cheated because we had – Mighty car mods. Which is amazing. On our and again, side. That's not cheating, mate. You, that's it's, not by accident. You'd a, earned that. It's a massive leg up to be able to, to get that instant exposure. So yeah. I, it's a, yeah, I don't wanna I don't wanna put down other people's uh, like I mean, people that make videos and, and do all that and really don't get anything out of it, I I feel for them because it's yeah, it can be a bit soul crushing, I suppose. Mate, it burns. <laughs> I can't tell you how hard it burns because it's 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 a, there's a lot of effort and there's a lot of great. Uh, there's tons of great stuff, mate. But there's so much. Literally and, millions of good. And this <laughs> of is the good problem: ones is and, it's it's very hard for the things to rise to the top. And yeah. what it strikes me is it's doing is it is effectively people who don't who aren't just making it because they like making it. Like I personally, I'm just stoked to make something and I do it to make me laugh and to entertain myself Yeah, because I know nobody else will see it. And if I just sort of keep doing it for that reason and if you sustain it long enough and you find your way through that you are doing it for that enjoyment and there there is less of that sort of quick reward, you've really got to cross quite a marker. Yeah, I think the the bullshit meter is pretty high on people. They'll know if it's not genuine and... And yeah, obviously we <laughs> we were always genuine. We were, we were just a couple of dickheads, like building shit and and enjoying it, and then and talking shit to each other like like mates do. And that kind of resonates with a lot of people. Is uh, a lot of the comments that we used to get were, I feel like I'm I'm in the shed with my mates, and that and that's people just makes them feel good so that's why they're watching it i suppose you know so. it's the abuse we love a bit of abuse that's <laughs> true friendships have a foundation of really robust yeah. back and forth and speaking of which mate man's not a camel uh can you hook a brethren up here he's he's brought beers in you don't want this uh quality noosa beer there we go got my hands on a heine here what a legend i need that heineken to Lubricate well, my we throat. do, mate. It's a Friday afternoon here in Brisbane. It's been a long week, a long day. I'm, uh, I was itching for another beer. And I'm going to uh, ask you a question as you reload over there. What was the point where you went, holy shit, this is a thing? Um, I think it was pretty soon into the, the Fairlane series it was just received really well um you 
You can tell by the – well, obviously you can tell by how many people watch it, but – Oh. And the big fucking plaque in the mail from YouTube, you <laughs> it. You're like, oh, oh, that's a nice little Well, this was prior to our own channel, so uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, we were getting huge views back then, like way more than we get now. It's, yeah, YouTube is a very hard thing to navigate as well. It's a, it's a faceless thing and it does, th- it does things and there's no one to tell you why or or whether you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing or how to do the right thing. But it's just it's like a it's like a game and that I found annoying because um, you're just trying to do your best and a lot of people are and and yeah, people come up with all these weird theories about thumbnails and everything. And it doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't it doesn't always work, you know, like you can and you can have great content and people won't see it because there's billions of videos on YouTube and that's that they've got to show it to, to the audience. So it's it's just a bit of a mystery in a lot of ways and that's probably one of the things that I think that's to their detriment because they're scaring away people that can make good content and bring people to the screen and the idea of you being at the screen is that you see ads. So... It's pretty basic, just like commercial TV. So, um, yeah. But back to the question, it we knew straight away that it was that we're doing a, a reasonable thing because you, the best, the good thing about YouTube is you get feedback like instantly. So if if people don't like it, they'll either not watch it and you get get no views, or you, or they'll tell you that you well, they're, they're you're not shit, sure. You're fat. You yeah. Who's this old? Dude, why is this guy bald? Why am I watching a, a you know, <laughs> like yeah, you got to get all sorts of stuff like that. So you you got to have a, th- a bit of a thick skin, but uh, you know, also in my my view was that they're not watching me because I look good, like they're watching me because I know how to do stuff, and and my thing was to educate people, so I would always explain. What, it, what I did and why I did it and, uh, you know, that gives people the context of what they're watching, not just look at this cool thing. It's like I do this because in my experience, if you do, do it this way, it doesn't work or this is the, this is the issues uh, and explain it as you go. And, and, and people, I guess the people that are watching it mostly are people that are aspirational at doing their own work on their car or, you know, that sort of thing. So I'm teaching them from my experience why I do things a certain way. So, and I guess that worked because people always watched it. Um, and that's what I enjoyed because I like sharing knowledge and stuff like that because well, there's no point keeping it to yourself. <laughs> I've got no competitors to, to let secrets out to. There's plenty of people that are far better at building cars than I am, but uh, I, I kind of do it at a, at a bit more of a garage level, I think. Like, it's, I, I don't, I'm, not a, I'm not a fabricator even, like, only self-taught. Like, I know fabricators and I know what they do and that's not what I do. So, um, yeah, just communicating with the, with the audience, I suppose, is the, is the best part of it, is when they tell you that you've helped them out They've learnt something, that sort of thing. That's that's good. Uh, that's bloody mission special. accomplished. Yeah, yeah. Because tell me about the nickname for people that don't know, don't understand. How the, the Turbo Yoda? Turbo Yoda. Because I mean, if you, if you are the <laughs> wise one, is is this? I mean, how how did that? Oh well, um, Blair Moog came up with that. And tell me the story. Uh, Tell me the. I don't know. He just came up with it straight. Like it's just he's he's an incredibly creative guy, and and just comes up with stuff like that. And and I guess it's the the root of it is uh, he's Yoda knows stuff, and he does turbos because back when he came up with that, I was I was a guest turboing an MX five for them, so it was the first time I was on their show. So. uh, I don't know, but 
it definitely stuck <laughs> as, you know, they come up with things like that. Uh, and you were the wise one. Yeah, I, I guess, yeah. Yeah. Well, that was always my role was just to be the guy that knows how to do stuff and then I'd barely say anything because I was – back then I was pretty shy and, uh, you know, the, the hardest thing about – well, the, this is the thing I tell people about being – uh, on YouTube or on screen or whatever is don't worry about what you look like because everybody knows – everybody except you already knows what you look like. So don't worry about what you look like and that's the thing that you've got to get past is like, oh, my God, is that me? Like I've never – you never you never look at yourself in that – you only ever look at yourself in the mirror or whatever. You never see yourself on the, at that different sort of uh, external view. So, um, yeah, lost track of what I was saying. Hit me with another question. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess you're sort of – you're becoming – because, again, you're a man that spun spanners and then all of a sudden you've had to learn how to act and present and – because, I mean, you're going into quite detailed work here of how you present to camera because I, I note as I talk to you that you are quite eloquent. You have learned. You don't use your ums and your ahs. You actually deliver a sentence with control – and I, I have to assume that you've had to put a little bit of work into that. The ums and ahs are terrible in pre-production. <laughs> we fix that. As, as I always say to Woody, just take the piss. Just fix it in the edit. And sometimes he puts together a, a chain of me saying I'm an ah. But in my defence, I, I don't script anything. I just talk about it off the top of my head and I can only do that because I know what I'm talking about I know what it is and and which is why you are Yoda well I just, I just <laughs> I'm just a, I'm a car dude I like I, I, I fucking love cars you've like. done lots of things you pulled many of them apart yeah. you, you you've just and they, and and cars are a genuine genuine interest to me like mm. it's like it's my thing well it's the being a dad been. is knowing things yeah mm. And yeah, I've learnt stuff about and things. Being grumpy. So, yeah, <laughs> well, that's my, that's my other sort of thing I'm known for is being grumpy, which I'm not. But uh, it comes with the age and the knowing uh, things. It's, yeah. it's inevitable. It's like uh, I preempt. I, I don't know. It's being again with age. I know that people are going to say certain things, so I preemptively go, "Don't bother saying it. This is why you don't do it." And one of my things that turned into a catchphrase was use your brain. It's like it's basically just like just think about it and you, whatever you, if it makes sense then that's what it is. Like don't – which is definitely a thing that people don't do much or – yeah, I won't, I won't go into that. But <laughs> <laughs> Let it rip. I love it. Right? <laughs> well, just instead of – waiting for someone to tell you the answer, use your brain and think about yourself. Like, because if you don't think about it, whatever they tell you could be wrong. So yeah, just some basic thinking, like what am I, what am I trying to achieve? What, how, how do I think I can achieve that? And how do I go about it? Like it's, it's just basic stuff. Like if you're going to mess around with cars, you need to have a bit of, uh, you need to have that thought process because you need to think about what, what it is you want and how do you how are you going to get it? It's same as most pretty much anything in life, really. Like, have a thing about it, and and you know you got Google now, and that makes things so much easier. Except for the fact that you've got to have a good filter. You've got to use your brain to filter out all the shit because there's a lot of shit in there as well. <laughs> that doesn't sound right. It's probably not right. And that's probably the big one is the cross-referencing and being able to go, yep. is this a valuable source or is this just some idiot repeating shit that he's read somewhere? Yeah, and there's tons of that. So, yeah, that, that's – like I do a lot of research for any job I do on – just on the internet, on Google and on YouTube, but I don't take everything as gospel. You still – you cross-reference it with other things and you also cross-reference it with what's in front of you and, and go, yeah, okay – this this makes sense, or not quite sure about that because it's it's not all lining up. So it, I'm not I'm not completely convinced that that's how it's going to work. But so yeah, it's it's a, it's a good resource, but not as good as your brain. 
Not as good as your brain. And I had a real breakthrough a couple of years ago with all this because if you look at my soft, delicate hands, you'll see that I'm not a man that's worked very hard uh, over the years, but I'm trying to change that. I'm a bloke that actually really wanted and has always wanted to work on his own cars. And I started over the last couple of years and one of the earliest projects I went to was the turbo on my old Land Cruiser 60 series, uh, 12HT. It sort of, that was right at the back end of its life. And I went, righto, time for a new turbo. I know that there's G-turbos and a few other things out there. And I had a look into it and my Googling showed me the Kinagawa turbos, which the internet immediately told me were big pieces of shit but I knew a Which lot of blokes. <laughs> I knew a lot of blokes who were drifting, who didn't take great care of their vehicles, kept these bad boys on limiter, and just punished the shit out of them for years. And I went, look, I know this isn't science, but I know how badly these guys treat their cars. And I go, these things actually do pretty good. And I went, do you know what? Even though the internet says this, I'm going to actually try it. And as an experiment, yeah, I put it on. And look, I've got to tell you, there was some real Chinesium in that kit and did have to rebuild a few other bits. But the turbo itself, yeah. mate, it's You can also pumping. buy six of them for the cost of a... Oh, I mate, like a thousand bucks. Saying names or not, but my, um, I've had a lot of experience with turbos over the years, obviously. Well, <laughs> that's why you are the Yoda of turbo. <laughs> uh, yeah, again, looking at things... Um, uh, like, don't assume that it's shit just because it's made in China. Like, well, Taiwan. Like, Taiwan's actually an excellent uh, manufacturing country. Uh, always has been. So it's a bit different to mainland China. But also, everything's built to a price. So if it's correct, if it's two hundred bucks, it's probably not very. Well, it's quite likely not very good, even though they do actually make turbos that work that are two hundred dollars. But uh, yeah. So, and also the thing that you got to think about is the. Turbo manufacturer in Australia isn't manufacturing the turbos. They're just buying spare parts. And guess where they come from? <laughs> I couldn't possibly fathom the major hub on the planet Earth where those things might come from. Yes. But look, if you do the math, you can probably you know divide it down to one of three places. Yeah. Um, and and this is but the it's just quality control. That's, that's mate, all it, it is quality is. control. And I was actually shocked to see that there was actually reasonable quality control on these. And it just, it irritated me that people, oh, no, they're better than that. Like, there was just, a, and yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, so what have you installed that on? Oh, well, I might, and it's always heard. three removed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't find someone that had done the thing. And I went, righto, idiots. I think this looks all right. I'm willing to gamble. And it was that. Like, that was the I'll moment let you know for when me. It, when it works. Absolutely. That was the moment for me where I went, hang on a sec. I'm going in asking, hoping to learn something, these fucking idiots don't even know what they're talking about. Yeah. They're I just should... parroting stuff that they've read. And, and... and the parroting is probably the thing that has really wound me up because I've seen it a lot as yeah. I've done that car and then some other cars. And I've, I've sort of done a few cars over the last few years now. And again, it's only for my personal entertainment. I've been shocked that I see the same shit in each obscure car community <laughs> and the same yeah. parroting of certain things about certain cars and the, it, it, and I'm like, hang on, I don't know if you guys have ever actually even touched one of these or maybe even seen one, but by God, you're quick to regurgitate mm. information. Yeah. yeah. And the people that aren't contributing on Facebook, they're actually the ones that know. And the idiots that are contributing actually don't know what they're talking about. Because they got sick of... They got Those sick of... Those idiots years ago. <laughs> correct. So. And and the people that actually provide useful advice, like how you go to Whirlpool or did go to Whirlpool when you needed good IT advice, it's trying to find places where you actually get genuine information. And what I found was genuine information was hiding in workshops. So what I started doing was just going and talking to fellas. Yeah. And oddly, if you weren't an absolute tool <laughs> and... People were more than happy to... Yeah, if you're kind and respectful and, you know, yeah. even try and spend some money with them, look out. That was super helpful. Yeah. And I'm like, huh, because he's done that and that and that and that and that and his opinion probably carries a bit more weight. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I've actually got a bit of a fetish about buying 
Chinese turbos. Just, just really? To see what the what the quality. Yeah, is. just well, and, and that was for me. I, I bought like, tons of them just it's like because they're five hundred bucks. They're like, so cheap. Like at, at most, and yeah, I bought a bought a few of them, and now they've all got like billet compressors and everything. So Mate, you're not and like you're not worrying about the casting. Oh, and, you're looking at it. You're like, this is amazing. The and that's the that's the no name stuff. Yeah, that I'm talking about not actual good stuff like you know like Mamba and Kinagara and stuff yeah. like that. It's made in in um, Taiwan, uh, which I bit of a tangent, but I I designed a uh, turbo kit for Toyota 86s in must have been when they were about a year old, and we ended up sourcing turbos for them from Mamba. And we, and they just branded it, put our brand on it because you can do that. It's like you ain't got to buy ten turbos and I'll put your brand. On. <laughs> so it's not rocket science, but the the quality of them is unbelievable. It's like this this is so good. It's it's obviously a Garrett copy. They got a, they got a copy of some, but the the actual quality of it is. And in a lot of ways, is better. Is is it's nicer. It's done better. It's machined better. It's it, the the casting of the housing is better. Like it's like how how is this how is this actually better? But it is, and and it's half the price. So it's like you just you gotta you, you do have to experiment. You've gotta you gotta like you do just buy it and see what it just looks like. Have a go. And if it's that cheap, she like I right. said, you can put six of them on before you you get up to the the. The purple anodized compressor wheel turbo that that's your other option. And this was my thing. Was and I it's a twelve it. HT. It's like it's just there to go, like make cool noises and and move the car along. It's not. You're not it's you know, exactly, mate. It's got like eighty horsepower. Yeah. Like this you, again. You're not trying to make it because I look at people trying to wind them up, and I'm like, but but why? Like it's a you know again, it's yeah. designed like a brick for a reason. It just. Mate, it'll do it five hundred thousand k's if you don't wind it up. <laughs> uh, mate, mine's mine's hit five twenty, and my engine is still unopened. Um, and I think I put the Kinagawa on at four ninety, give or take. So the factory turbo nearly made five hundred. Yeah, it probably would have. If you did. Yeah, oh mate, it probably would have. But yeah, cut, I, cut I've actually still got it. Out of it. <laughs> yeah, I've actually kept it, and like you can give it a little wiggly woo, <laughs> and you're there going, "Poor, trees, you've." Uh, it, it doesn't matter as long as it's not hitting the housing. You've heard your <laughs> squeal, and it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> but look, I also did just want to put a more modern turbo on it um, because I did. Because we like to tinker. Like, look, we not? like to tinker, but you know what was really killing me? Uh, was in particular, actually, not too far from Karamundi to loop back. And you're trying to go, uh, you go past Calandra and there's there's the sort of there's oh, a few yeah. up and downs. Mate, the poor old cruiser, you'd get her up to full noise going down and full noise was like, 103 and then you'd try and pump it up the next hill and mate you'd be doing like 42 <laughs> and you're just there going bom, bom, massive bom, line of traffic oh mate cursing your name and i'm like if i could just like hold 110 i'd be like so stoked and so i thought if i got something again more more modern, more efficient it didn't have to be more fancy i'm like there's been you know a lot of mm. decades of r&d if it just True. is mildly less shit, that'd be amazing. And that was a fairly low bar to be mildly less mm. shit of a car that's done half a million yeah. kilometres. And they it did quite well to get a turbo to last 500,000 mate, Ks that was built in 19, what, 88? Mate, mine's 1988. Yeah. I've got an 88 Sahara. And I, I'm no, I'm like, routinely astonished by sell that, that and buy a house. It's worth a few dollar it <laughs> is now. Dollar, yeah. Mate, I bought it for a buck fifty back when people were like, What the fuck did why you would buy? You, that? Why would like, you want that? What yeah. fucking idiot would buy a car with more than four hundred thousand kilometers on it? My wife, when I put her at home, <laughs> she's like, What have you done? I remember asking her permission. Uh, we were out for sushi with my boy, and I'm like, Look, I found this car and she's like, Absolutely not. Never you ask for forgiveness, right? <laughs> I've since learned. Came home in an EL XR6 Barra swapped with one of my mates, and she's like, What's that? Mate, it's a new car. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it wasn't pretty. It didn't it See, didn't go well for me. I approve of all these purchases, so I don't know. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. look, she thinks I have yeah. terrible taste. My f- actually, no, no, no. Can I can, can I back up and tell you a story? Um, I came home and it's a two tone Sahara as well. And again, this was also the time for Land Cruiser enthusiasts. So I paid sixteen thousand for this, and that was like top of the top of the top of the tree. It was a one owner car. How long ago was that? Oh, mate, we were back in the teens. And I looked at the 60s and I went, these things are going to pop. Like, that is an amazing car. And you were paying 10 grand for one that was like rust and falling apart and non turbo. That's pretty much most of them, yeah. That's why they're so worth so much now because there's Mate. none left. So I picked this thing up. And again, I looked for about a year and I found this car. And it was a lovely um, older fella. And he and his wife had travelled Australia and had. You Many know, times. Yeah, you know, red dirt <laughs> everywhere. I got the satellite phone with it as well. And it was the sort of car purchase where you had to be approved because they'd had a lot of people come and, you know, they were yeah. going to fucking chop it up and ruin it. And, like, this had this had been their family car. Yeah. Kids grew up in it. They saw Australia in it. They'd and been everywhere. it would have been it. incredibly expensive when it was new. That's oh. the thing that people don't understand. Like, that's what, that was a... That was probably like Mercedes level cost back so then. So, 1988, my specific car was bought by a Japanese consortium on the Gold Coast. Uh, it was owned by them by the consortium for one year, and then these guys bought it. What were they using it for, <laughs> mate? Well, again, you remember Japan. You know, Japan coming to the Gold Coast yeah. at that point in time. Yep, yep. So that would have been. You know, the fancy, like a, let's yeah. go and see Australia. That would have been pick them up from the airport yeah, and yeah. show them. Um, take but, it, take oh, them to the golf mate. club. What else is that golf club out at? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. It's where they have the... Yeah, Corralbin. Corralbin, yeah. yeah. How, that's, yeah. that's like, wow. Yeah, <laughs> shit the bed pretty hard on that too. <laughs> um, but it's such a... It, it was one of those things where we had a cup of tea and we talked it through and then we finally did the deal and shook his hand and then he's like, well, we've got to have a beer to celebrate. And... And interestingly, oh, mate, I, I I stayed in contact with him because he was so happy to know it was going to a bloke that loved old shit boxes um, and that my family was going to go travelling in it and we'd go and see Australia in it. And I would send him photos and I sent him photos of us on Fraser and my little boy with me and, you know, all, all the amazing places we went. And then, yeah, the, the point came where I didn't hear back from him and I'd sent a few more emails because he, he, he wasn't well and... It was probably a year down the track and his son responded to me and said, look, I'm sorry, he's no longer with us. Um, But I continued to send him photos of that car, me and my family, Mm. because I I have taken great care of that car. I've I've added little things to it, but I've kept it... I've kept it it original and kept it going. I think that's 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 something really um, sort of special about... The fact that it's still alive. Mate, it's still... Well, this is it on the stubby cooler. So I love this car so much. And this car was fundamental in me changing my entire life direction. Um, I, like... That that car, for me, was a fundamental shift. And the first time I sort of went, do you know what? Who gives a shit? I like this. (laughs) Fuck it. Fuck everything. I just want to do this. And... That was an enormous change, and and it's when you meet those sort of people, and you you know that that man, I'll ne- uh, you know, and again, I'll never forget him, and I've got bits and pieces of things, and again, I you know, keep that all quiet because that's just out of respect. But it's very special to me that he allowed me to buy his car because yeah. to me, you know, as our Lord and Saviour Jeremy Clarkson says, you know, it's not just a bag of bolts and metal; like they are special, they have a character, they like they they are a, a they are an entity. It's been through a lot. It's That's been the thing you got to think of. Like, look, look at look, if if it could tell you stories. Like, oh, I'm sure, they'd be mate. Pretty. If it could tell you stories, and mate, mine's got the rear air con and the yeah, the yeah. turbo stitching in the seats. I mean, oh, yeah, oh, chef's kiss. I know. Just so when I saw it, it's but, like peak eighties. Oh, <laughs> but people Absolutely. didn't like it. Okay, so two things: they didn't like the high roof. That was not cool, not fashionable. And if it didn't have the round lights, not cool, not fashionable. In Land Cruiser 60 Series world at that point in time. Didn't like a high roof. Didn't like the high roof. Better than a roof that's rusted off. I thought so too. (laughs) Well, actually, this is still rusting as well. (laughs) Fucking rust, mate. Jesus Christ. That's why there's none of them left. There's a company that makes aluminium bodies, apparently. Oh, that'd be cheap. I've heard about it. I'm like, (laughs) oh, mate, it's like 60 grand, as I said. What do they they say, mate? When I win Lotto, they'll be... be (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Mm. 
but they're just – and I think this is what it all comes back to is that, that to people like you and me, what we do and these cars and these relationships and these friendships, like they're, they're special. They mean something. The stories mean something. Yep, that's for sure. It's – yeah, I've met – so many people through, well, originally forums, you know, like the good old days when you had forums and... What was your handle? <laughs> um, what was it? I can't remember what the original one was on... So, RS Liberty Club was my stomping ground because I was a Subaru guy and I was kind of one of the guys that knew a lot and... Oh God, I can't remember what it was now. I think it was just Al afterwards. <laughs> I was like, sit on very... Not very creative. I was going to say, you didn't put a lot of thing into that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was, it was very descriptive, I thought. Oh, well, I knew exactly what it was. It's, yeah. it's Al. That's where I met the, like, Marty and uh, from Marty Carlotts of RS Liberty Club, you know. Like Seriously. He was, a, he was a Subaru fanatic as well. So that's how we basically knew each other off the internet. And Benny, he was also a Subaru guy. And, uh, yeah, now we're, like, like very close friends sort of talk each, every day on, on the internet and that sort of thing and obviously we've gone and done a lot of stuff together and that sort of thing. So you meet you meet like-minded people through that interest in cars and that's that's probably the coolest thing and get you go and experience stuff like, you know, we've done some pretty pretty cool stuff like Drag Week with Benny and, and that sort of thing. Like that's a that's an incredible adventure driving around in America in a drag car and, and, you know, it getting raced every day and then doing 500 miles or whatever in it. And, yeah, it was, uh, done that a couple of times. It was, uh, like, probably one of the best things I've ever done. And and also that car, we previously drove it from Hokkaido to Matsusaka, which is down the bottom of Japan. When it was stock, we, we bought it in Japan and like the idea of being able to buy a car like that that is standard and still works is just you, you wouldn't even think that would be possible nowadays. But this is I don't know, I don't know it must have been six eight years ago, I guess. And and it was like the coolest thing ever. We just drove this car, and it had like velour <laughs> seats and a two liter my favorite engine that had like eight horsepower and it used so little fuel that we thought that the fuel gauge was broken. I think it got like six litres per hundred kilometres. <laughs> it's like, what? How? How does this work? But yeah, we we, we still talk about this. It's just, it was just a road trip, like three blokes driving through Japan and then we just dropped it off and, and it eventually got sent back to Australia, of course. But yeah, we've had a lot of history with just doing cool stuff like that with, with, with cars, of course. Like it's kind of like... It's not, it's not, it's not everything, but it's like that's the sort of link, I guess, between like-minded people, I suppose. It really is, and it's been one of my great realizations over more recent years. And I think I'd, I think I'd failed to acknowledge the importance of the relationships that I have with my friends that I've made through cars, and how pivotal those relationships have been. And they're not people that knew me for any other reason than the dumb things I liked. And we're like, hey, you like dumb things too. <laughs> me too. <laughs> yeah, hey, let's it. do more dumb things. Yeah. And I'm like, yes. Yeah. And, and it's literally that. And it's that every time. And my wife is just, she, she's like, what is wrong with you, mate? Like I, a dude came to buy a car off me once and then like we became lifelong friends. And, and they just, you know, we stood out on the footpath and chatted for like three hours. Yeah. And she's like, Do you, you know that right? guy? Like, what, <laughs> what, is, what, what, is, what is going on? And the other one she loves is all the random people that drop past all the time. And she's like, why do people just always turn up at our house? I'm like, oh, I've got a thing and he needs a thing or I've I need a, a thing and they need a thing. Sahara in my driveway. <laughs> That'd Absolutely. be enough to attract them. Oh, mate. I, I feel like – I honestly feel like the uh, yeah the king of the world. I have an XR6 and I have a 60 Series Sahara. Yeah. I mean, I feel like such a gangster. Yeah. You're living the dream. Mate, I'm living <laughs> the 90s dream. Like, I'm a 90s millionaire. Yep, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Like that's oh, it. Pfft peak 
I also just finished an E36 convertible, so I'm like a Hope Island 90s millionaire <laughs> yeah. now. I'm going and playing yeah. golf on the weekend. Yeah, as well. can, which car? Which car shall yeah. I take? Top to down the, the oh. Japanese golf resort. Absolutely, <laughs> to Coralbin. Which car will I take what's to Coralbin? Yeah, you definitely take the Sahara to Coralbin. But mm. what's the the one where we did the super cheap ad? Was an ex Japanese golf country club that was was abandoned. Uh, what's it called? It's in the, right in the middle of the Gold Coast there, and uh, went broke. And yeah, that was in its heyday. That was a like Japanese golf country club. It was a pretty amazing looking place. You could see that it was cool back in the day. Uh, yeah, my Sahara would have been there at some point. <laughs> yeah, nineteen eighty nine. Maybe that's, it was parked. It probably there. lived there in nineteen eighty nine. Parked under the, in, the, in the garage <laughs> with the, the guy with the white gloves, absolutely ready to drive it, and doilies over the seat and that sort of thing. Yeah, good. Good times. Mate, not just good times, the best times. And this is the problem with this stuff and this is why we keep going back into it even though it occasionally chews us up and spits it out, spits us out. The best times and like the hilarity and the stupidity and the friendships and the shit talking. I mean, that's why we do it in the first place. Yep. You didn't do it to become a YouTube celebrity like you never did it for that not i i can't uh, sitting here and chatting with you i couldn't imagine you wanting anything i i couldn't imagine you wanting people to come up and talk to you as as somebody who was going out and doing this sort of stuff and go oh, like mate like fame and like fame, fame seeking and, or whatever yeah no. oh, you, you do not strike me as the fame seeking guy but, but yeah when people always come up and talk to me all the time which I think it's great because it's like, you know, you because know, I know that they're car guys, massive, and they, yeah. And it's like, yeah, be like, going, man. like yeah, it's, it's no big deal. At any airport I would go to, obviously that's all switched off now. But I'm assuming because no longer on the internet. You'll be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> the internet's yeah, forever. Yeah, remember, always meet someone at the airport. Like they'd be just like, oh, and then just have a chat. It's a car you got. Cool. Thanks for watching. It's, it's great. <laughs> Miles it's Tangent, a, what do your wife and kids think about that? And they're like, oh, for fuck's sake. Like, it, 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 uh, they, or, or do they think it's pretty funny? Or they? So, oh, they have a term for it. They call it fanboying. Ah, yes. Uh, Dad, got fanboyed. Ah, da- <laughs> yeah. Dad got fanboyed. Which is just a, like, is this a, in, in like a family joke, I suppose. Because I think. Did that add, did it give them cool credits in high school or? Um. That dad's a pretty cool guy on the internet? I think only when they were young because, like, every 10-year-old wants to be a YouTuber. and so that, That's go, my son's my, dream. My dad is a YouTuber. And they'd be like, what? what? But when you say, oh, oh my dad, when, when they're, like, 16, they're like, oh, my dad builds cool cars. They're like, yeah, whatever, bro. Really? <laughs> yeah. Really? The cred drops off. Yeah. It's, uh, oh. it's, it's pretty odd. Like, it's just like a concept. Like YouTuber, obviously, obviously they don't really know what that actually means. <laughs> no, they just see. People. They don't know that it's actually a job and it's not easy. <laughs> yeah, and that it's actual work because yeah. that's my son's dream. That is his yeah. that eight-year-old boy. That is all he wants. He wants to be like Mr. Beast. Yeah, that's it. The end. Which yeah, that's uh, funny, and I'm sure they get over that and realize that that's not really a thing, unless they. I mean, you got you got to have. It's also what is a YouTuber? Like you got to. It doesn't mean anything. You've got to. You've got to have something. You've got to be something. You've got to show something. You, you, well, it's in the name. Broadcast yourself. W- what do you do? You got to. You've got to do something. Otherwise, people are not, not going to watch you. There's nothing to watch. You can't. Just, oh, I suppose people do just stand there and talk about stuff. But uh, yeah, the one I like. It, I can't believe that it's a thing where people. Like put a camera on and then walk up a hill, and it's just watching them walk. And like that's I've a, never seen that. Mate, that's a thing. I don't know if I could do that. Yeah, that that's all I do. They like just put the camera on and it's like the crunching of the walking. Oh, and the like walking in the ASMR, type, ASMR thing. Yeah. type thing, and I'm just there going. I can't. Oh, I like that for a little bit, and then I'm like, you're trying too hard. Yeah, I'm like, I'm that's bored now. What I, yeah, yeah. It's like I don't really need to hear every little crinkle 
Actually, do you know what I'm really enjoying at the moment? Uh, people building log cabins in the woods. I've clicked on a few of those. Uh, they've popped up in my Facebook timeline. And now because I've clicked on like 37 of them, they keep That's coming all up. That's getting now. And <laughs> holy shit, whenever I see somebody building a log cabin in the woods, I watch that in its entirety. I uh, don't know how what long it is. does it take so, in real time? Oh, fuck, mate. Like months? It goes from summer to winter to summer again. And they're there like with an axe chopping each thing. Oh, and like, then like no proper. No chainsaws or anything? Oh, again, you, you don't see it off camera. But I'm like, <laughs> I know how hard it is to do that. They're like cross-sectioning an entire yeah, log. And I'm like, I'll fucking bet you didn't do that with your tomahawk, mate. <laughs> but that, yeah, do the dugout and then put the moss in and the whole shebang. Yeah, that's, that's pretty wild. I'm like, that's wicked. I just watched, like, most of the time I'm just watching like dirt bike videos. Crossy demons are dead no, on no, VHS. Just, just like <laughs> dudes with like eighteen subscribers riding their their um, like KTM through the through like a single trail or whatever in the bush in Australia. Just that's because that's my thing. That's what I enjoy. So it's got. I just I can just like sit there and watch it and just think just think that I'm doing it. Like you know, like it's like putting yourself in that in the place of the guy because it's all you know point of view sort of thing. Odd. <laughs> do you ever jump up and comment on those channels? No, nah, usually they're like they literally got eighteen subscribers and and no comments. But it's just like I appreciate that they just press record on their GoPro and then uploaded it because that's more effort than doing nothing. And and I'm watching it, so it's that's why you got to give them props. Let them know Yada was here. Oh uh, yeah, I subscribed to him and stuff. Hey, hey. But, <laughs> yeah. It's good. That's my uh, happy place is the, the bush on the bike. So. Do you do a bit of it yourself? Do you get out? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like every week. Well, not this week because I'm here, but yeah, every every week usually. Just go out with a couple of mates. And What's the weapon of choice? Uh, KDM 250 two-stroke. Yeah. Exactly what you wanted as a young man. Well, maybe not a KTM, but two, mate, two yeah, fifty two stroke. Probably would have never heard of a KTM back then. Yeah, but, yeah. but a two stroke no. two fifty. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a definitely a, a, a throwback from not having it when I was a kid. Absolutely, sure. But like doing it when you're forty, I think it was like forty two when I bought it, and it's uh, and going, geez, this is really actually hard work. Well, it's <laughs> quite physical. I enjoy it because it's like a, it's a real like a brain thing you gotta you're thinking about what you're doing all the time and it's like you, i don't know i don't know if people think you just sit you don't just sit on a motorbike and and press the throttle like at least not on a dirt bike you, you, it's it's body movements like you you're balancing the thing you're moving around on it you it, it's 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 like your like a cyborg i suppose or whatever like you're part of it you, you, the bike does its thing and you do it but you got to be doing it together otherwise it you eat shit, <laughs> which I've done plenty of as well, but that's all part of it too. That's oh, good. It's really weird because most of the people that are out there are uh, my age. Like, it's an old, it's an old guy's sport. It's re- it's odd. Like, why why aren't there young people out here doing this? It's it's so strange. Because like, they're working and crying that they can't afford a house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they're at the motocross track doing sixty footers or something. Yeah. I think a lot of it, though, is that when you finally get the capacity to do it and you go, not getting any younger, fuck it. It definitely is. A, is it's like, well, why haven't I done this already? Because it's the best. But be, prior to that, I was working. Like, Mate, working kids, working family. Working kids, what, yeah, just like, flat out. Just, you, you, never, you don't stop. Like, from here I go home. You know, my wife's at home with my boy. We've got two other kids staying over and then we've got swimming in the morning. Like, yeah. it, mate, it is back to back to back to back to back. And you do not stop. Yeah, you don't have time. to. This, it's a whole day sort of thing. So, oh. And I guess, yeah, like I, I, the, the kids, are old, when they're older, they, yeah, you don't have to. Yeah, they're doing their own thing. Do yeah. all that stuff and they, yeah, especially when one of them gets their licence, that's the greatest thing. Ever. Absolutely, you can get lit and they can come pick you up. Can't wait. Oh, for you that. Just, but you make them take the other kid to wherever he's got to go as well, and they're like stoked because it's like when you're 17, all you want to do is drive anyway. Well, mate, so, drive everywhere. Yeah, so I, I made sure I build a 
a cool car for my son because I, I didn't want him to have any excuse not to do our bidding, drive our, our other kid around or, you know, and, pick and us up. So w- what did your boy get? Uh, his first car was a Subaru, of course. Uh, what a shock. Six-cylinder, six-speed wagon, 2007. It was actually a family car and then I converted it to auto manual and that sort of thing because you obviously can't have a, an automatic when you're a young male. Well, you can. You can if you want. Don't, he would bring no, I'm not shame gonna judge to you. the family. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, mate, he would bring shame to the family. <laughs> My boy's going to learn three pedals even yeah. though – do you know what makes me really sad is I think I'm the coolest with my cool old shitboxes. My son doesn't like nothing, like zero, doesn't register. Tesla. He wants a Tesla. And I'm just there. I'm like, yeah. I, I said to my wife, I said, I, I'm not sure. Like, was it the postman? There's something going on here. There's something's, something's missed. So it's a technology obsession, I think, with Teslas because it's like, it's basically just a big, a big computer, <laughs> with a with you sitting in it. So yeah, I know a lot of yeah a lot of kids really love oh. that, and it's a. I mean, I'm not really into electric vehicles, but I think it's pretty awesome that they made these things and got them to get like you could buy them and they work. That's oh, amazing because yeah. the only electric cars we ever knew were golf carts and like they were just hilarious and you'd try and do wheelies and tip them over and all sorts of funny things. Yeah, and then a couple but of M70s real... would fall out yeah. under the seat. Yeah, they weren't <laughs> a real car. Like it was never going to be a real car. And then the fact that like my son gets to drive around in these ridiculous cars and like, I mean, come on, we've got to barrow the doses and like nothing, 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 nothing. Like I'm, 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 Heartbroken. Uh, I'll just give you, just from my experience. Please help me. Sixteen, nothing before that. Like my kids grew up with me doing crazy shit all the time, their whole life. Nothing. Then sixteen, bink. Oh, cars are cool. Just it's just like an awakening. Like interesting. Yeah, because his mate that's coming over tonight bloody loves it. And I was so stoked that there was a kid that wanted to talk to me about my cars. <laughs> and I'm like, do you want to go for a drive, buddy? And he's like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, yes, this is what I've been waiting for. You're, and then, you're and my then new I'm, son. And I'm like, and then I'll take you in. Do you want to go in the other car? And he's like, can we? I'm like, yes. And, and, you know, you're taking them through the fleet. They got a lot to distract them. Oh, like, mate, they do. But I was so stoked when, like, a kid was like, yeah, I actually really like the old cars. I'm like, yes! I, I just think it's hilarious that an eel falcon is considered an old car. <laughs> oh, <laughs> mate, <laughs> isn't that the worst? <laughs> an old car is like a 60, 60s car to me. Not, I don't even think HQ is old, because 70s. Anything that has chrome on it is now old officially. But, but uh, the fact that we're, what year are we in? 1994... I just picked up a uh, 1992 vehicle and I can put it on Club Rego. Yeah. <laughs> and it's when you go, yeah, it's yeah. Like, what? Because I owned one of these vehicles back in the early 00s and so it wasn't an old car at that point. Yeah. I lost money on it, as you did with old cars. You know, I bought high and sold low because they were worth nothing. Yeah, that seems to be a thing. Yeah, that was a thing. <laughs> well, it used to be. It used to be. Um, and and yeah, you're looping back now, and you, but it was the realization that I could put this fucking thing on club register. I'm like, thank God it doesn't cost anything to register. Oh, well, it's a bit of a bonus because it's got twelve cylinders. So, oh, interesting, spicy. Is it a Jag or a BMW? BMW. Yeah. Like a seven fifty. They sound. The thing I love about them is. When they crank over, they sound like the, – because there's so many cylinders, it just makes like this – the starter noise is like – and then it just runs. It, it's like that's what a Formula One car sounds like when they start them because they, you know, probably that particular Formula One car probably had heaps of cylinders as well. So you don't get any sound from the starter mode. It just goes – and then and then all of a sudden there's just engine running noises and it's like what what's happening? Yes, do do love a V twelve. Amen. I've played with a couple. 
Well, I've got two Bosch fuel pumps coming to go into this one because we've isolated that down to being the issue. And is, this, it, is it EFI or cage it? Oh, pfft, no, I don't even know what you're talking, it, mate. You might as well be speaking Dutch to me. I don't think BMW ever used cage it. That's yeah, cool. so 92 this is. Um, what I did learn was that they have two computers because basically yeah. they've got their two sixes and two things and then one that talks. Re- it's redundancy, yeah. Yeah. Even Toyota did that. And the, apparently you can drive Toyota. them on one bank. Yep, 100%. I'm like, poor. Oh. That's what it's for. It's like it's wicked. You lose a whole engine and it's still... And it's still a whole yeah, engine. You probably wouldn't even notice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mercedes I was wetting myself. I think only Jag wouldn't have done that because what's the point of having a Jag if it doesn't break down? Absolutely, right. mate. If it's not dropping oil, it's, mm. is it really a Jag? True. Yeah, right up until Ford bought it and fucked them. And yeah, put Falcon parts inside. <laughs> Jag, and I'm like... And potentially made them more reliable. <laughs> oh, dear, but... It was yeah, no longer. There, there's a, no soul. It was no longer a jerk. There's, there's no Lucas uh, electronics yeah. leaking. Yeah. It, it, look, they, <laughs> the Jag has a special personality. Yeah. I you actually don't love those old XJ sixes and stuff. There. Uh, That's a bloody beautiful car to drive. Mate, uh, funny story. That's what the old boy had. There's photos of me sitting in XJ sixes because Dad, you know, wanted to be a big pimp in the. Uh, in the eighties, and uh, that was his car of yeah. choice. Were you picking the wood grain off the dash oh, like a kid would? No, I, <laughs> I loved it. The cracked wood grain? No, ours wasn't cracked. I uh, it was only it was quite young then. I white suppose. XJ six, red leather interior, sheepskins over that, of course. <laughs> yes. Did it have sheepskins on a seatbelt? No. Oh. But it was magnificent and it had the the radio and you turned it on and the antenna went up and like electric antenna. I had never seen anything more (laughs) impressive in my entire life than pushing that and watching that go. Since cars don't even have antennas anymore. No, they don't. Uh, But like electric antenna. That was the greatest flex I'd ever seen. You didn't have to go out and make an Australia out of a coat hanger and shove it in. No, none of that rubbish. And then it had a button because it drank so much fucking fuel. It had two fuel tanks yeah. and a button to change from one fuel yeah. tank to the other. Yeah. I'm like, this is that's such a gangster. That there's a lot of stuff that's really cool about them, and then then it's like that's like a mini, like a fuel tank on each side, sort of like a Cooper S had that. And then they're like, shit, we've got two tanks. How do we get the fuel? And then they've just gone, shit, we're just going to make this really complicated. Set up and even worse when they're fuel injected because then you've got two, you know, you've got to have two pumps and, <laughs> and then they go, yeah, it's just, it's just so, it's so British. But they are great when they've got a, a better engine in them that isn't leaking oil everywhere. So, you know, like an LS or something, you know, like, and that's probably, uh, it's boring i suppose like an ls conversion is boring but then the car is actually when you're driving it it's like you don't know that that's what's in there it still feels like a friggin jag because it's just it has this very skinny steering wheel leather and and there's like wood grain and shit everywhere and smith's gauges no they're they're bloody awesome cars and that's surprisingly how many of them are, are still are left like i don't know how many they sold in australia but i wouldn't imagine it being a be lot, big numbers. And, because and they, probably, still, they would have been crazy expensive. They're still not that popular. They're like right yeah. on the extremities I, I think of the a, scene. It's a, like one that's probably gonna. It hasn't got there yet, but oh, I, no. I can't imagine it not happening. But because it has to. The XJs. They're I not think, a terrible car. They, but they had one of the most beautiful aesthetics with the, yeah. the way that they sort of rolled and they came down and it was a bit of a dovetail and it still had the chrome yeah. and the oh, like everything about it. It's yeah. just a magnificent car. Probably go out and live and say it's probably the best car that the Poms ever made. I think so. The series uh, was it series two or three? I can't remember. But the the eighties XJ. Yeah. Oh no, hang on. The nineties they built an XJR. Remember when they did that? It's like a big coupe thing. Isn't yeah. It? Oh no no no. They did a four door and then they made it go fast. Oh yeah. They peaked. That was magnificent. It would have had. Did they have like a better engine in it by then, or was yeah. that a V twelve? Uh, I think they supercharged a V8. Oh, yeah. yeah that's right. Yeah, supercharged. Like a Range Rover. Yeah. 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 And it was a proper, like, pimp rocket. And then the Daimler product made it all confusing with its weird... 
and they were speaking remember, of badge engineering, like yeah. what? That was like, that was a really odd time. They, they were doing that in the seven. They were still doing it in the seventies. They had Daimler. That was an odd time. And then mate. they had those Daimler two fifty things in the sixties that were a Jag as well, like a S type, but they had a two point five liter V eight in it. Which you can imagine how incredible that would have been. <laughs> Two and a half litre V8. Would have made nice noises, but not much movement. Not a great deal. Yeah. But you would have had fun doing it. My brother's actually got a... a uh, he's got an S-type and a E-type. But they're pulled apart in a farm shed. <laughs> I have to ask the serious E-type question. Do you know which series and which engine? Uh, 3.8. It's a Series 1, I suppose. So not a V12? No. No one wants a V12. No. Lies. No. I can't. That back. It's all... Ah, no, no, no. There's one that doesn't look like that. That's the 2 plus 2 mm. you were talking about. Okay. Yeah. You can get a V12. I can't. Yeah, I can't. I can't. I, that looks like Homer's car. That, that Ah, the Homer. The oh. bubbly back thing. Yeah, it's mate, like the, it's the, way too the close to the plus Homer. 2 is hideous. <laughs> They're the ones that come up for sale for people that want an E-type but miss the boat. Yeah. And you buy one of those going, I've got an E-type. You're like, and everyone's oh like, oh, my God, God you got make, an E-type. Yeah, mate. Make it stop. Yeah, the, the person who designed that was blind. Um, <laughs> like, yeah, they, they were missing eyeballs. Let's make a sleek sports car. And then. Or not. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it was definitely turned into the Homer. Uh, yeah. It was the car for every man. <laughs> yeah, that is not peak E-type, unfortunately. But I can assure you, V12 E-type is... Uh, is that is that the be, is that the most valuable one? Oh, it's up there. Yeah, I don't really know that much about them. Apart from, well, I know, you know, I know what an E Type is, but I don't know what. It was a car it, that Enzo Ferrari said was the most beautiful. So okay. that's pretty pretty yeah. big props from I, the. I think it's probably. I reckon that's a bit. Yeah, and no, I think Ferrari made some pretty nice cars back then. <laughs> like a, I I yeah. don't disagree, but when. Yeah. Mr. Ferrari, at least, mate, uh, to, guess, give a, uh, to give a nod. Yes. That's a uh, fair chop of respect. So who who designed it? Was it designed by Italians? Probably Pinafrana. Yeah. Because <laughs> usually they were pretty – they were on their game back then. Oh, weren't they? Anything that had that badge on it, Baton, Pinafrana, any yeah. of those sort of cars. Ugh. Even like weird stuff like a Zuzu Bellets and mm. – Mate, for uh, me it was Fiat X19. Yeah. Gorgeous. I'll tell you a story. My third car was a Fiat. Get out. 124 oh. BC. Beautiful car. Mate, they're the best. Fiat very, 124 is like very that is impractical for a 19-year-old. Oh, terrible <laughs> car. But never break down. No. I'll give it that. Like but People mate, always said it's going to break down. It's going to break down. It never did. I used to drive it. Like everywhere, long long distances and everything, and it was bloody. It was like four and a half grand, and it was like. I thought it was like very. It was. I don't want to say show car, but it was. Mate, it was one two four cc. That 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 was. You were a man of BC. culture. BC. Oh, yeah. sorry, you're but, a, but you were a man of culture in that car in the yeah. Fiat one two four. That yeah, it was a it was a cracker, and I put the twin uh, downdraft webbers on it. Of course you did. Oh, my God, the sound. Man, you could twin, hear each valve oh. opening. <laughs> it was amazing. Twin downdraft webbers, again, if that's not something that you've enjoyed in your life, you probably don't understand why this is so special. Yeah. For all this, the fuel spitting out and wetting the bonnet and everything, that doesn't... The sound of them... Not not just at full noise, but like I could. It's it, a chorus. It's, it was way. unreal. Like, yeah. and it was such a better car with the with those on there than than the whatever the single car it was on it, which was also some sort of Weber. But yeah, no, it was, a, it was an awesome car. Mate. I have dreams that that I forgot that I didn't sell it, and it was just like you know in in Dad's shed or something. Still there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, old people things. Just dreaming that you. Didn't sell your valuable old vehicles. See, for me, I'm not, I'm not upset that I sold it, but Alfa Romeo 33 1.7 litre Cloverleaf, so it had the boxer engine with the twin downdraft webbers. Yeah, 
the like front wheel drive, front wheel drive, T drive sort of gearbox. Yeah, That's the one like an Audi sort of sort of layout. One but of with those. The boxer, yeah, with the boxer. But it would have been rusted away though, wouldn't it? It was magic. Uh, bought through John French Alfa Romeo oh, yeah. to apply some context. I, you'd know that because yeah. they were also a Subaru. Yeah, correct. Uh, and I recall about the time, and that would cross over fairly well with your experience. That car taught me the magic of Italian vehicles and my mechanics said to me, they said, if you want this car to last, red line. They said, just <laughs> get up it. Italian tune up. Every gear, <laughs> every day, all the time. And do you know what? They were right. Yeah. That car served me for like 13 years or something stupid. No way. And like tons of work to it. Redid the like redid everything, and you learn and you learn about uh, trail trail braking, oh. and, like going into a corner and just letting the letting the throttle off and it. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, you know, uh, uh, well, understeer, but then also because I made it go a bit faster, um, was being able to control when your front wheels are going wild, and then learning how to yeah steer into and with that. But for me. The lift, twin lift down off oversteer. Is lift off oversteer. Thinking. That's what you're yes. looking for. <laughs> oh, look, it's a bad time. And when you get it wrong. Oh, it's yeah, but it's sometimes it, some of them are that well, the chassis is that good that you that it'll, it will just do it. And you know what it's going to do and, and you can keep doing it. And then that's how you drive a front wheel drive car fast. Oh, I suppose. they're unreal. Not but every car is like that. You probably got to set it up, I suppose. Well, it was also very hard to modify back then because having an Italian European car. Trying to find parts, I was like reading catalogues yes. in German that and they'd have. You've got to be in the Italian car club with all the other very strange people that enjoy such vehicles. It was very hard. I, I had I found a wrecking yard that was also a workshop, and that was what sustained it. And it basically sustained it until they closed, yeah. um, and that was the end of. Sure, that, that, aren't they are the that ones that had r- terrible rust problems, though. Aren't they? Oh yeah, they're terrible. Yeah, it was, was like great. an eighties car. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh mate, there was Russian steel apparently. Yes, uh, yes. That the was steel the was left on the docks. Um, and uh, yeah, it was uh, very poorly. Yeah, why would they buy steel? Yeah, so it was steel <laughs> made in Russia and then left on docks, and it was oh, yeah, so yeah. pre rusted. So it was Russian steel pre rusted. And then turned into Alfa Romeos with electronics again built by the people that designed the two plus two E type, and, and electric like Magneti Morelli. Oh fuck! That's the, the the Lucas of <laughs> mate, you, you don't know pain until you've owned old Italian cars. The weird thing is Magneti Magneti Morelli makes like uh, Formula One like control systems and stuff. <laughs> like they couldn't even make a friggin' old. Alpha like stay running. <laughs> it would trust them to do that. Mm, no, it fills me with great fear. I would never buy one again. I think I had points in my Fiat, so it's pretty hard for me to get that wrong. Possible, but the majesty though, and the sound of those cars, and because they love to rev and they love to, they they really rewarded you for. Mm. It was it's just driving uh, like enjoyment, I suppose. Not a fast, or not fast, anything like that. But, but like, it was a celebration. Getting listen to there. that noise. Oh yeah, those what are the, the Alpha, the V six ones. I think it's yeah. also something V six with the it was rear gearbox, rear wheel drive, rear gearbox, mm, front transaxle thing. Yeah, they were pretty awesome. The GTV. Yes, yeah, yeah. I remember we had we had one at the it was like a trade in at the dealership, and I was. Like, Things really strange, but inboard brakes. Yeah, but you got to admire the, oh, the engineering and stuff like that. With whether it was durable, but you know, it's not a. They're still it's not a Camry. Today, like, mate, it is not a Camry, yeah. and they did make driving <laughs> exciting. The other thing was the offset pedals uh, all over to the right and all in a space. Yeah. yeah. Of like so if you had big hoofs, you were in trouble. But no I, work boots allowed. I got I got <laughs> some reasonable flippers on me, and I could never drive that car with shoes on. Yeah. Always barefoot because I could not. Because if you had shoes on, you'd hit more than one pedal. Yeah, and you'd I I would only use my toe to operate the accelerator because that was about the width of it. <laughs> yeah, they're bloody special things. I those. don't know. I, I can't. I don't know if I like the offset driving position thing. It's really. Putting 
but I know a lot of cars, a lot of uh, European stuff is like that. And at some point I was like engineering brain thinking going, I think they're like that because they've converted, they've built a left end drive car and then gone, well, we need to sell it to England. Probably don't give a shit about Australia, but, and then they're just like, oh, fuck it, fuck it. With it. <laughs> Whatever, yeah. Like it's not, built, it's, it was never meant to be like that. No. Uh, because so it makes sense on the other side of the car. Yeah, yeah. But no it probably does make sense on the other side of the car, but now we've had to do this silly British Idiot. thing and now... Idiots. Yeah. <laughs> Why yeah. are these idiots? <laughs> on the other side of the car. <laughs> idiots. Yeah. No. You just imagine the Italian people there going, I don't know how to say for fuck's sake in Italian, no, but I could say it with uh, my hands and they're like, saying for fuck's sake. You know what we should do? Yeah. Make the steering crooked. Yeah. <laughs> and do you know what else we'll do? Screw those guys. Yeah, what we're going to do <laughs> is we're going to shove the pedal box all the way over there yeah. so you, to punish them you're like, for their every, dumb... Everything's on the wrong plane. The seat's yeah. out of the line yeah. with the steering wheel and the steering yeah. wheel's out of the with the pedals. This will be That's great. The driving experience. So. Yeah, they're like, this will be great. Have you got a, you got a sore back years later from yeah. being pushed sideways. and That's the one. Yes. <laughs> See, they, now we know what's up. We've, we've worked it out. My joke was the exceptional value I used to get out of my RACQ membership. <laughs> yeah. I mean, mate, <laughs> I got my money's worth. You, oh, The number of toes I would get here, yeah? When that bugger wouldn't start, which was a lot. What, why wouldn't it start? Just ah, no, things? something would break. Yeah. Just more than... Just anything. Just stuff. Yeah. Stuff wouldn't work. Something would melt. <laughs> something would break. It's funny how you just, like, accept that shit when you're younger. It's like, you know, it just didn't start. Whatever. Whatever. Well, <laughs> oh, look, now it starts. Cool. <laughs> I, I, I think being, being a me- like a mechanic who knows how things work, the freedom of being like that must be awesome because that, that isn't the way it's like, oh, it doesn't go. And then your brain's just winding through a thousand pages of what could be making this not go, whereas... The, the the average guy that just likes driving a car yeah, just like, goes fuck ah oh, doesn't go it's got to go back oh, to the mechanic it started sweet let's go yeah like, <laughs> yes. that never happened <laughs> must be great uh, well you got to laugh mate I mean I'm here today I have uh, I I'm in my uh, ELXR6 today and uh, the door handle latch broke uh, so the internal mechanism let go so at the moment I'm putting the window down. <laughs> Opening from the outside, yes. putting the window back up, and then yes. closing. So, because I haven't had the minutes in the day, it's like, it's like Ford thought of everything, mate. <laughs> Unbelievable! And I laugh as so I shut the door. In is the that car. like redundancy, mate? Like, the whole car like just an rattles, and it goes. You shut the door, and it goes, Bleh. and the uh, you know the paint that's lifting, and the clear coat. The clear coat gets water under it when it rains as well so it's it's, oh, so it's like a um yeah so it's bubbling and it has water <laughs> under it and i'm just there going ah oh, god i love that australian manufacturing <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you just go you stand there looking at it and you're like i can't fathom how they don't make them here anymore yeah i just i don't what I don't, did go wrong what went wrong but have a look at a ve commodore oh, now oh, and see how bad they are and then fuck. it's like I'm like, how did somebody... They're amazing at the time, but it's like, give it give it enough time oh. and it, it will be a piece of shit with the, with the hood lining on your head. Mate, the hood lining like on your head. Like, if they had done that simple stuff properly, you might not be in that situation. Mate, I've got a VE ute that, again, had that specific problem, the hood lining on your head and... Yeah. Yeah, yeah just... That's been a staple since VNs, I think. Got the old thumbtacks in... I actually like what sort of someone someone get better glue. Come on, oh, mate! You can buy a can of Bunnings. <laughs> yeah. Like I've used it to repair whatever so you, many things. Whatever your spray can, just get some of that. Get the spray can from. But there. they were still using the same glue, <sighs> like 
from 19, 15 years later or whatever. <laughs> and it's still and they all fell down. And you're going, <laughs> oh, God. So, like just one person. Can one person go, we acknowledge this is a problem. Yeah. We're going to fix this. Are you not aware of Toyota's philosophy of relentless improvement? No? Yeah. Haven't picked up on that? No. Okay, that'll be the interview. Cool. Thanks, bye. <laughs> like, it just never caught on. Yes. That because uh, – and. Look, this is probably a bit philosophical and middle-aged man of me. Um, but the fact that the Australian government protected the industry and then jacked taxes, yeah. which still exist. So luxury car tax was created to protect Australian manufacturing. We still have luxury car tax, hilariously, even though we don't have yeah. Australian manufacturing. But the, the industry was protected and insulated and it almost like the American banks. It sort of thought it was so big Lazy. it couldn't die. And it was lazy. Yeah. Because it wasn't truly competing with yeah. superior products, they went, no, 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 keep paying us more. We'll just make whatever fucking dog shit we like. Yeah. And would you believe that's not the key to success? Sounds exactly like the uh, US car industry that yeah. nearly died. Same thing. Again, they just they made big very, buckets very of shit, that they didn't. taxed everything else that was coming in. Yeah. But then people get a taste of the other stuff and go... How come well, you guys I think make it's worth this? Because this is so much better. This is you. like and like because it's not like a little bit better. It's not like one x better. It's like seventy six x better. Yeah. Everything in every direction, in every angle, in every way, is like yeah. That goes back to my Subaru Liberty versus oh. V R Commodore. Yeah. Revelation, and it's like working on them, doing everything to them. Like, and you're like, why is this really shit? And the other one, like, just amazingly good. Like, are they all rocket scientists <laughs> over there? I mean, this is magnificent. It's quality yeah. control, yeah. Like, they tried. Whereas, yeah, I don't think they were trying real hard. Especially back in the fleet car days. Like, we, we're the biggest selling car. Yeah. And Falcons are next or vice versa. Correct. Yeah, but that's whoever got the friggin' yeah, like whoever government. Got the, whoever got the taxi contract <laughs> and whoever was making. Yeah, the, where one of them was a taxi contract, the other one was a, like a. Yeah, fleet, got, got government the government fleet contract, contract yeah. because the Prime Minister was driven around in a Senator and a Calais and all the other things and, and that was the peak of wealth and everything mm. else was just edged out. And you're there going, as much as I understand what you've tried to do, you've actually simultaneously broken it. Mm. Yep. I did hear today though, and I don't know if this is accurate or not, I haven't fact-checked this, there's a company in Melbourne making cars... Because we, we lost Brabham recently and, like, there's just nobody making Australian cars. Like, is there anybody that you are aware of that is manufacturing? A, a whole car? Yeah. Because I... I is that <laughs> like, secondary manufacture going on? Correct. With, with American cars, but... But there's nobody... There's no Australian manufacturer that I'm aware of here in the year 2024. No, not that I'm aware of. No, because with Brabham losing that name... And that was just like game over. That was sort of the end. You know what they should make? Tell me. Gicotelos. Can I get an amen? Speaking of, is that, is that the body of the, of the, the car that you had? Uh, no. I, if I remember correctly, it's a GTV and then they put... Oh, so it was the... V6, correct, it was V6 the... One, yeah. Correct, that one. Yeah, that Those was sick. Transit <laughs> made. They were sick. Yeah. And again... That was Calandra, I think, no, uh, man. Correct. Correct. And if it's they're always going to be doomed to not continue in hindsight, but oh, the just the concept of it was amazing. The the drag racing tragedy was obviously the 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 thing that caused them the most issues when they ran the drag strip the other way around. No, oh, yeah, probably that, shouldn't have done that. That was a terrible idea. That was a very fucking bad idea, and unfortunately, that was the car being driven, and that um, that sadly is the legacy of that car. Is don't drag race that car the wrong way. Yeah. It, it won't work out well for you. Yes. Yeah, which is just sad beyond belief because I was talking about this the other day, actually, and the only person I could think of that w had done anything recently was, yeah, Tom Rebold with his bullet cars. Um, yeah. yeah. Where he built, and again, people looked at him and went, isn't that just an MX-5? And didn't realise that he actually built, like, the whole bloody thing. The yeah. front of it was all custom. It's very hard to stretch across the yeah, time. Here. Yeah, hang on. You ready? Hang on, we'll give you the sound. Yeah. It's like you're here having a beer with me and Turbo Yoda. Oh, mate. It's Heineken too. Yeah. Definitely do the job. There's a touch and a Heine jo joke in here somewhere. Mm. Yeah, those bullet things were quite... 
I think they did rotaries before they did the uh, V8s, the one new Zeds as well. Mate, he was big into the one new Zeds. Yeah. Uh, still going too, would you believe it? Tom, yeah. He's a he's a lunatic, I love him. Um he did he was doing EVs eight years ago, he was drag racing them on the soft flats. Yeah, right. Like he's a lunatic. He's a man ahead of his time. And again, he's somebody that I don't think has been fully appreciated in terms of the insanity that he has brought to the Australian car market. I don't think people have fully appreciated what that man's done. Well, just to be able to run a business and keep on top of stuff like oh. that and, and do cool shit. To still be there and still doing yeah, it. And like, like still doing it now. Yeah. And just down at Yatla, so you can even get a pie. Uh, it's astonishing. I mean, again, you know. You know how hard this industry is. Yeah. Everything in, about it in every facet. My experience trying to build a turbo kit and sell it gave me enough insight into how difficult it is to just the R&D time to try and do something properly and then and then bring it to market and then just everyone wanting to buy $3,000 Chinese knockoffs of of a $5,000 Chinese knockoff of a $6,000 <laughs> um, <laughs> Japanese brand that was actually made in in uh, Taiwan wow it was it was a great it was a cool experience I actually enjoyed it, but anyway, getting off. <laughs> yeah, so you <laughs> so, learned so, stuff. So, <laughs> what was the brand of your turbo? Uh, we, well, I was in partnership with a guy that, who was a tuner, who was Coyote Tuning, and um, he had the car. It was his personal car, and he, he was a circuit racer. Um, so he provided the car. I provided the, you know, the turbo Yoderish things, and. We it took it took years. Like we, I did like handmade shit. Tried different turbos. Tested he track tested it and dyno tested it and did everything. You know, like it was it was, and very track orientated. It was it was not meant to be a like uh, it, it wasn't meant to be like the ones that were actually successful <laughs> because you couldn't see anything. It was underneath the. It was mounted underneath. I had cast manifolds. My friend is a like a pattern maker, so he made cast iron exhaust manifolds, and it was all kind of more like an OE sort of design philosophy. Like a you know, like a, I don't know if you know much about Subarus, but the WRXs have got cast exhaust manifolds and then like tube uh, joiners from each side. So it, it had that same sort of setup, um, and then a watered air intercooler above the turbo and then the throttle body. So there was no pipes uh, or anything like that. It was all uh, direct feed straight out of the turbo into the engine. And that was to get the heat out of the engine bay because when you're circuit racing them, rather than just p hard parking, the turbos that are mounted up high, they melt everything. They melt the fans and, and yeah, obviously that's less than ideal when you're trying to go fast. So, you know, we spent years... Messing around, sold, say, 20 kits, I suppose. And, yeah, it was it was difficult to meet the market because the market be went from the first buyers were like professionals who wanted an enthusiast sports car, which I think they're a great car. And when they sort of got a few years old, they'd come out of lease or whatever and they'd sell them. And then, and then at that time they weren't worth very much. So then, then you'd have like a, a 21 year old kid would buy it, put big wheels on and flares and neons and whatnot uh, and wrap it. And they didn't want stealth. Uh, they wanted to be open in the bonnet in the Broadwater car park or whatever the current uh, relevance is. And show their mates. So yeah, it was. It became difficult to, to to basically just to market because it wasn't the the car ownership changed in the meantime. So it went from true like racing enthusiasts, like club level racer guys, to just normal kids that want to cruise around in a car. Which is, uh, yeah, that's this is something that you you you'd never pick. Yeah. You had to learn the hard way, so kind of just like eventually, just to, it just died. It 
died a natural death in the corner sort of thing. I've still got bits and pieces of it and got all the patterns and everything to make the stuff. But, yeah, it was a bit – never really worked. But I did learn a lot about what it takes to actually design and manufacture something to a high standard and it's very difficult to to sell it for a reasonable price unless you've got bulk money behind you to to like inject the capital into it basically to and to advertise it and all that sort of stuff so yeah it was, it was interesting what i have realized though is if it's on the transition and it's you know with the young kids it's going it's not far from looping back so you're probably going to need the future old man special, <laughs> where then yeah. the what the the survivors will actually yeah. want these special subtle. Yeah, how, how many years are we off that? Thirty years. Oh, yeah, I don't we're, know. We're, 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 what is the cycle? Like yeah. when one of the one of the guys that bought it, they're going to be what? They were thirty year old professionals, and now then yeah. they're going to be like fifty. So yeah. Give it another 15 years. Yeah, another 15 years. So if I was you... Back into production. (laughs) I'd just make a few and I'd like shrink wrap them and have them ready to go. Just put them on eBay now and they'll be on eBay for like seven years and then all of a sudden it'll go ching and you'll be like... What What was that noise? What? (laughs) (laughs) Like, oh God, it's happening. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know if I, I don't know if I want that. <laughs> ah. I'm just going to tick it up to uh, um, learning because definitely learned heaps. I'll bet you did, mate. Just but it, that's a wonderful thing to just have a go. Yeah, it is. It's uh, yeah. I don't I don't regret it at all. It, was, it I I, bu- I built something from an idea in my head into a reality, made it work. It worked well. It just was not – didn't meet the market, I suppose, is the excuse that I'll throw out there. But, um, yeah, I think it's probably something. I, I actually enjoyed the the brain, the thought, everything that went into being able to work it all out. And it was years. Like, it took me years to – it's kind of like a, a side project really uh, – Mostly, so it was all done on the on the side, and you know, obviously favors with my mate, he's a pattern maker, and uh, but since then, once I, because I didn't really know how the whole pattern making process worked, and to cast something, it's actually, and most people probably don't. It's it it's a it's a very interesting process, particularly since it's something that was they were doing in the eighteen late eighteen hundreds in the after the industrial revolution. Like it's not a new process, but it, it's quite interesting what goes into it. It's like a it's like a woodworking process is how I would describe it. So he makes cast iron and aluminium things as the end product, but his job is carving wood. So I'm gonna I'll probably just leave it there because it'd go on forever, but it's such an interesting process to get to you holding on to your turbo exhaust housing or whatever. Someone that the start of that is usually someone handcrafting something out of out of timber, and making all the smooth edges and yes, yeah, it's, it's a super interesting process. Because is that the mold? Because again, I've watched a lot of these videos as well. There's uh, along with log cabins uh, where they press the things into the sand mold and then pour yes, the metal yeah, into yeah. it and then pull it apart. And so you, you got to make so you got to you got to make every you got to make the air part and you got to make the sol- you got to make the solid part first then you make the bit that isn't the solid part out of the <laughs> that's it's hard to hard to describe you've got to copy the thing that you or, or let's say in this case you got to you got to perceive the thing that you want to make and then you've got to look at what isn't what is air, then make the thing that is air solid and make it all fit around each other so the only bit that you can see is... is. <laughs> but then it doesn't end there. Then you've got to make a thing that will hold sand. So there's just sand and then you pour metal into it and then at the end of it it goes... 
solidifies and then you bash the sand and it falls off and then you've got a piece of metal. Like it's just, it's just such a wild concept. But also, yeah, like I said, it's, it's not new. It's like it's from uh, in, after the Industrial Revolution. That's what they use. Like, you know how Poms love casting shit? Like, Absolutely. Every, everything. I watch it and people melt the cans down and yeah. then they've got the little thing at home and I must say I've thought about yeah. it because I've looked at that and I'm like, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, before people Denny's. had a 3D printer, this is what you did. This it's is how you 3D printed <laughs> shit. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, my friend Denny's, because he, he works in the industry, he's got like a lot of mates that do it. And some of them have got their own like foundries at home <laughs> just because the, so and they just, just for fun. They like melt down yeah, old melt red motors and shit stuff. and yeah. like beer cans and make yeah. make stuff. Just make things. Because yeah. you can. It's pretty cool. fun. So. Since I found out what all that was about during that process of making this turbo kit, since then I've sort of used him or utilised his skills and made other products to go with it. Stuff that's much more practical and simpler usually, like manifolds, uh, like barra, uh, like the top manifold on a barra. We made one of those that we sell. Oh, we sold hundreds of those because it's – a budget sort of – it's like the fancy ones that you buy that are like, you know, all welded and everything, but it's just cast, so it's, it's way cheaper. you just got to make it in volume and, uh, yeah, someone uses that stuff. And yeah, it's been quite a cool thing because it's uh, – you just got to account for his time to do it because the actual making of the pattern, if you got to make it, you don't make one. You got to – you, you want to do it with something you're going to make 20 – a hundred, whatever of, bloody earth. potentially, uh, yeah. So, well, that's it. You want to make shitloads. Does that's, he get into the metallurgy as well, or like how far down that? Yeah, they've got to know all of that. They've got to know shrinkage rates and everything like that. And it's it's super technical. Like, oh, he, he's my age, so he's he's and he did it. He was an, as an apprentice. Like he's been he's done it for thirty years or whatever. So, so he's melty metal he's, yoda. He doesn't actually cast do the Yoda. casting. He does. He only does the pattern. But you got to pattern Yoda. You got to. You got to. I just want to see the Yoda Bros. <laughs> I mean, you blokes together. I mean, that would be some. I'll, real I'll put pondering. that to him and see if he's see if he's keen on it. He might be. This is fantastic. He might like being called casting Yoda. Yeah, casting Yoda. Yoda. Yeah. Yeah. Sand Yoda. We get in there. I didn't know. I didn't know the guy for like twenty years and never knew what he. I knew that he was a pattern maker, but I never knew what it meant. That's fantastic. Yeah. What, what did he drive? Uh, That's how we usually He's a people, Subaru guy now. Is he? Yeah. But, yeah, he was Statesman. Stato. He had a HSV Statesman, which was like a v, VP, I guess. Yeah. Age. SV5000i, I think it was called. It was like a pretty rare one. Special. Had, had all sorts of rent, like uh, HSV specific parts on it like brakes mm. and everything because it's so big that you couldn't that were very difficult to find so yeah he had that for years that was pretty cool back in the this is in the 90s sounds like a pretty cool guy just quietly <laughs> knows how to make shit <laughs> yeah. cool cars i'm like let's be friends yeah. i can see how this would have happened <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah that is a fascinating process though and again when you talk about it i can see the excitement that you have as you're as you talk about just the, trying to get your head around you're making it's something so, from so nothing. interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, what fascinates me with that is you're talking about casting because I understand that process, but then trying to make the internal components and getting the tolerances right and understanding yeah. how insane tolerances become in those processes to me that's mind blowing. He, he does a fair bit of um, re like. Get a lot of those old, like Holden cylinder heads and stuff that they made cross flows and stuff like that. It was super rare stuff, and people bring them to him, and and he re does uh, makes a new pattern so they can make new ones because and like the old motorbike stuff mm. that you can't buy anymore because it doesn't exist. Yeah, there's none so, left on the planet. So yeah, you just if, as long as it's in in a in a a condition that he can. You shape know, and make a make. pattern from yep. yeah yeah so quite cool it's insane and actually lo- and he loves it too which is yeah. like, it's which is quite interesting because it's so such a random oh to me it's such a an odd 
uh, like trade that I guess it's, it's it's not really, but most of the stuff they do, they make mining components and stuff yeah, like cool. that. So you, well, you make the shit that where the money is. Yeah. And then you do cool stuff. But these guys, yeah, they if it's the same as anyone. Like a lot of mechanics just go home at the end of the day and, you know, have a beer and watch TV, but other mechanics go home and build cars. Build cars, yeah. Like it's, it's, it's a difference. Like there's always, you know. Yeah, if it's a job or if it's the passion. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And whether the job crushes the passion or whether the passion, yeah. It's absolutely the, a big challenge is getting your, your, your job crushing your passion. <laughs> that, that, uh, that's just something I had to go through at, uh, when I was younger. Uh, luckily I got through it. When did that catch you? Mm, when you probably were ch- in about 2000. Like, mm. It's like, why do I... Because mechanics didn't earn... And up until about... Like last year, mechanics earned nothing. Like it was like one of the lowest paid trades, one of the most difficult trades. And yeah, you'd be lucky to get twenty two dollars an hour or whatever. And and then your sparky mate or your chippy mates getting like forty, fifty, sixty dollars. Well, that's an it. Hour. And they're buying seventy nine. Yeah, they're cruising and around in cool cars and, and you're there brand new shit. And you're like poverty street. Yeah. <laughs> you're you're buying. Going, like, I'm hoping I can buy bread this week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good thing so, I can still milk a cow. It, <laughs> like, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> I don't have to worry about the milk part. Yeah. <laughs> Except for you've got to buy the cow, which yeah. is obviously expensive. But yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. It's, it's, it's about the money, I suppose. Like you, you're you trying to get somewhere and you, you don't seem to be able to because – and the answer to that is you've got to go into business for yourself. Correct. Like that's that's just really the only answer. Like you're not going to make a lot of money. You'll never make big bucks as an employee. It's the rules. No. That's just how it is. That's capitalism yeah. 101. Yeah. Like you – Buy somebody's time as cheap as you can, and you resell it for as much as you can. <laughs> the end. And boy, do dealerships do a great job of that. Like tw- twenty dollar an hour apprentices at one hundred and fifty dollars you know an hour. Like this. mate, dealerships are what prop up the financial model of dealerships. I, I was horrified, you know, in the mid OOs when I played in dealership land, that y- your service departments rolling a hundred grand a month back in the OOs. And mm-hmm. you're like, so hang on, we don't make any money from selling the cars. Huh. And I was there going, whoa. And you're just there with your brain exploding going, holy crap, it's the apprentice making $1, yeah. changing <laughs> your thing. You get a $3,000 invoice, it costs $1.50 plus parts. Yeah. Right. Yes, pretty interesting. Mate, astonishing world. You notice a lot of... The dealerships are not run by anyone that's got anything to do with cars. They're run by financial Correct. management experts that just can see a, a, a yeah, like a model. Like this is how we make money. It's, Absolutely, and it's not from not from selling a brand new car. <sighs> that's actually I, I'm not sure how they make money on the new warranty things. Uh, to be honest with you, how they give cars with like eight years of warranty. I actually don't yeah. know how they the make money. The fixed price like servicing is ludicrous, though. That's is it. Yeah, it's fixed price at a really high price. Mm. <laughs> I just assumed it was finance now that it was dealer finance where they made all their money these days. Yeah. I don't I'm not. Oh, thinking. like dealer actual, like, yeah. Internal finance. Yeah, yeah, internal finance. And then when you so go you're past. You're the bank. Absolutely. You're the bank. And then you go past and go, do you know what you need? You need all the things. And do you know no. what? You should just finance yeah. those. And the, there's a. And uh, also usually an incredibly attractive young young lady so, saying that to you. Absolutely. <laughs> and I, yep. And that was yeah. the traditional model was the uh, – mm. What do they call it? The uh, accessories girl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not sure if that still exists. I don't really buy from dealerships. But uh, nah. that that was the thing. And he bought my first new car like last year. Really? <laughs> Jeez, you have hit the big time. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck. You know I've never bought a new car. No. Uh, what did you buy? Let me guess. It was a Subaru. No, <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's my retirement rig. Mm. So that's a, yeah, like a, a BT50, like a dual cab ute. Yeah. Which uh, is... Uh, BT50. Yeah, which Bloody is, terrific. Which is a D-Max. Right? It's a D-Max. Okay, yeah. so hang on. Talk me through it. Is it... Why that car? Because it's a D Max and you couldn't buy D Maxes because they were this was COVID and you couldn't couldn't get anything but you could get a BT50. Yeah, nobody wanted a BT50. 
for a while until I realized that they were actually a D-Max, but, but with carpet. <laughs> yeah. Took a minute for people to figure that out, too, yeah, didn't it? it? Did, like, yeah, I was yeah. really shocked. I'm like, what do you idiots not realise this is a great it's car? It's exactly the same car with – at least they didn't put a shit front end on it like they but, did with the Rangers. Like, yeah. It's like, here's a Ranger and here's a BT50, and they're the same car, except one of them looks ridiculous and the other one looks like a – a uh, like an American truck thing that everyone wants to own. Correct. Yeah, this one looks not much different from. I just, mate, I think the new BTs look great. Yeah, so. mate of mine actually has a business where that's actually all he does is doing up BT fifties because people were not doing up BT fifties, and he's like, "Hang a sec." Yeah. <laughs> Some people want to do. What's he called? Up. BT fifty guy. Uh, no, uh, Josh Bodger. So what's his? Jeez, I wish I could think of his business. I give him a humble shout out. I should be able to think. That's not the, like, the botches of Mazda dealership back in the day. You'd be spot on. Yeah, in Toowoomba, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, Ipswich. Ipswich, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, it just came to me. Built Wild. W-Y-L-D. Built Wild. George Bodger. But that's all he does, is be, t- like, that's... Because yeah. they yeah. There's plenty of them. Again, <laughs> people didn't realise, and people were buying them beca- because they were available, and you could actually get one. And then they went, hang on, if you put some shit on these, they look fantastic. Yeah. Jack them up, big bull gonna, bar, nice set of wheels. Going to get to that, actually. Mate, tough as guts. That's why I'm, I'm trying to put too many Ks on it. How much of an old man am I? I've got to, got to preserve this for my retirement. <laughs> Jesus Christ, <man>. What the <laughs> fuck has happened? What has happened to you? Uh, oh, God. It's all right. I've done, I've done like four services on it. It's done 15,000 Ks, so. The most looked after car I've ever had. <laughs> well, look, that's a big deal buying your first new car. As I said, I'm yet to pop that cherry. Yeah. I would never... Uh, it was actually just like a pay, pay, pay shit tons of tax or buy a car and not pay tax. So it was pretty easy. And look, honestly, <laughs> I, when your accountant says if you could just do you this... buy a car. Okay. You're like, okay... <laughs> They're like, either you can give this money away or you can have a new car. Yeah. And you're like, here, yeah, pay all this money to the government or get a car. I'm like, mm-hmm. tough one. I'm like, <laughs> you just twisted my arm yeah. half off. Yes. But it wasn't a very interesting experience because I had to buy it from Cairns because there's mm. none anywhere else. Classic COVID shopping. So, <laughs> so everyone else has got pictures of their car like all clean with a big red bow on it. At the dealership, and ours turns up like at a trucking company at, at the port of Brisbane. <laughs> like, it, be, it must have been underneath, like a like a sixty series, on the way down. The it was just like just covered in <laughs> covered in oil and shit all over it, just like dirty as. And I'm just like, yeah, this is this is quite the experience. So, yeah. yeah, I really feel like I've got my money's <laughs> worth. Did you have to pay COVID tax on it as well? Oh you? yeah. Oh yeah, it god, was it was. Yeah, I think it was about ten grand more than my Ooh. my mate bought one uh, when they first came out, and it was yeah, it was ten grand cheaper. Was like, oh, uh, was COVID. Yeah, COVID tax <laughs> was a very odd time, mate. Yeah. Now, would you believe this? I'm led to believe that you were in a bloke that's very conversational. Would you believe that we've been talking smack now for nearly three hours? Uh, is it dark outside? I don't know. Is Can't tell. It's like a casino. Yeah. You? <laughs> you don't know. No. You keep spending. <laughs> keep drinking Heineken's. Mate, how good's a Heine on a Friday afternoon? Yeah, it's pretty good. I That's can't. it. I was worried about the world previously. Can't now, complain. Uh, now I'm all right. Because uh, you, you said, mate, you're uh, going out for dinner tonight. What what was the uh, cuisine? I think it's called Cartel's Mexican Restaurant. Which there you go. Is, uh, yeah. I'm not sure about the name, but mm. got, to, got to call it something, I suppose. I, I, I mean, I right. called my YouTube channel The Skid Factory. Oh, exactly. Fuck it, idiot who, do that. Who am I to fucking <laughs> fuck? <laughs> You're not real good at naming stuff, stuff, are you, mate? All right, anyhow, Alan. Oh, we're in a hurry. You, you know. got Alan and Heidi mm. performance part. Mm. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah. And, mate, tell well, me. Well, the, the biggest joke that my mates have is my business name's Allied, and they're like, her, her, Allied. It's a, it's a very, very long-running joke. Like, Not very funny, but but I've got to give it to them. <laughs> Look, they're consistent. It's my, sure. my level of, of, of friend, you know, it's like the whole, if you 
not giving you your mate shit, then you're not actually your mate. It's not actually your <laughs> friend. Exactly. Yeah, They're not fucking ribbing you yeah. on. That's, that's not your buddy. Ah. Uh, what does the next 10 years look like for you, Turbo Yoda? Uh, so, I'm, yeah, started working just back in the shed in the traditional manner. So this is allied? Yes. That's, that's what the invoices say, yeah. Oh, uh, fucking liar. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't lie. No. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. It's a, it's Alan, a false Let's, false, let's false go back to Alan Hyde here. Yes, yeah. yes. So, you know, just doing that. Uh, so just a couple of weeks in now. Yeah. Uh, and what sort of customers? Like who, who's coming? So it's pretty similar stuff to what I would do. Like I don't do – I do stuff that probably other people don't want to do or they're too smart to attack, but which I enjoy. So uh, so my easy job at the moment is a 78, 77 Celica with a Beams 3 SGE. Nice. Uh, so that's gone pretty well. Uh, it kind of just fits and works and stuff. So, um, yeah. And I've got like a Silverado, like a 93 model Silverado, a huge dual wheel thing, like like 3500 3, or whatever they call them. I don't know. It's just like Yellowstone inspired. Hu- yeah, massive thing. Yeah, yeah. And it's got like Alcoas on it, like the truck wheels with the adapters. Rig. Yeah. So I put in a, took the 454 out of that and putting a Duramax. Gangster. And Allison in it. Yes. So I do a bit mess around with the big diesel stuff a little bit. But Excellent. Not really big diesel, but big big, bigger than a Hilux. Big enough. <laughs> and I've got also another Duramax project that I've been sort of working up to. Interesting. Uh, that's a drag car. So we're going to try and be the fastest diesel drag car. Or well, maybe the fastest registered one at least. Like it's going to be a drag and drive. And... You, you'll appreciate this. It's a, an XH ute. So pretty much your car, but a ute. <laughs> Fantastic. You know I've got an ED as well. Oh, nice. <laughs> I'm a man of culture. <laughs> no, wonder, yeah. no, no wonder your wife's stoked. Oh, she's fucking disgusted. <laughs> no, wait for it. I'm trying to get the 90s trifecta, which to me is E-D-E-L-A-U. That to me is the holy trinity of Ford Falcons. Yes, yes. A-U. So, oh, I don't know. We shouldn't start talking about that. Yeah, they could go go on forever. I've really liked them. Hey, I, I think they're the appalling styling, but the car's actually quite good. They're a wonderful is, car. I mean, mate, they're a cockroach. They they will outlast yeah, oblivion. That's it. Yeah. Like the world will explode. <laughs> the the sun will <laughs> yeah. die out. Yeah, and they'll be fucking AU falcons of, floating around shit the universe. Tons of cockroaches <laughs> driving <laughs> AUs. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God, you're a man after my own heart. Oh, you like the finer things in life. Oh. Yeah, so other than that, I've got plenty of, oh, I think I've got about 10 jobs lined up, so. Wow. No shortage. So, so it's on. Yeah. Oh. And is it going to be allied YouTube? No, no. No more filming? No, no. No more I've filming? Done that. I don't know. None. Oh, well, Woody will come and film Okay. Yeah. Probably at the end of pop in interesting jobs. Like you'll probably film the Celica because it's kind of interesting, but it'll just be like a single episode. So you're going back to special guest appearances. Yeah, just, just yeah. like how you began. Yeah, and uh, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm happy to do that. And I'm, I'm going to work with the Mighty Car Mods guys uh, as well a bit more because I haven't been able to because just too time hectic, hectic on our own time mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. And and that's why I enjoy <coughs> doing stuff with them because it's it's always cool. The cars that they have are amazing. And it's totally it's different. It's fun. And it's not your responsibility. Yep. Like I you do your bit and then you leave. I'm like, yep. And they go, how do we do this? Yep. What should we do? And I say, okay, this is how I do it. And they go, okay, that's going to how we're going to do it because they Perfect. have full faith in me. and Which is great. And we do it and, uh, and then we it have works. a bit of fun. And then you reinforce. And that's, that's what it's supposed to be about, just hanging out with your mates, hanging working with on the cars. You. Yeah. Can I get an amen? That's uh, it's pretty simple. <laughs> it, it is, mate. And if you overcomplicate the recipe, and you take the fun out of it, yeah, that's where it's that's where it gets. Try dangerous. not to stray too far away from the, nah. that original. Um, Find your true north. And yeah. just stay on that. Yeah, so. that's really exciting. So you're going to get to do a little bit of, yeah, a few guest appearances here and there. Yeah, 
Yeah, and I do enjoy that. And I enjoy stuff like this, like podcasts. Like, yeah. I think they're great. I Go love listening to them. Just, yeah, people, everyone's got a story to tell and it's fun listening to everyone's, you know, life adventure, I suppose. It's the best. How they became who they are. My favourite, though, is the people that are like, I don't have anything to talk about my life. And then they come on and I'm like, mate, I wouldn't be asking you if I didn't think you're a fucking legend. That's the main reason you're here. Yeah. And, like, they have just these incredible stories. Everyone's... Well, yeah. Incredible. It's, I think it's a saying, isn't it? Everyone's got a story. Everyone's got a story, yeah. mate. And everybody's story is important. It's not exciting to you because you know it intimately. But to everybody else, they're hearing it for the first time. Yep. And that's True. really special. And that's, as I said to you before we even started recording this, I love meandering conversation because meandering conversation to me in the year 2024 is a lost art. Yeah. Do you know how often I get to sit and speak to somebody for three hours uninterrupted? Fucking never. <laughs> if my wife could get three hours uninterrupted with me, she'd be absolutely shocked and horrified. You know, if we get <laughs> four minutes of communication yeah. time without being interrupted. Yeah. This is You're lucky, and, yeah. Mate, this <laughs> is special. Like the, the podcasting thing, as I said to you, you put the headphones on, and you disappear into, um, yeah. I- into a parallel universe where nothing else exists. We're in the casino lighting, so you can't tell if it's day or night. And you just talk. And that is magical to me. This is not too hard, especially when you're talking to someone who likes cars as well. Oh, yeah, it's like just like well, I've, I've and I've noticed you. Shit about I've noticed you staring at some of the things on the wall here. Yeah. And each one of those has a very special story. Let me assure you. What's that? Uh, which one? That. Uh, to the left? The cityscape the... one. Ah. Are you ready for a story? Yeah. Everything has a story. So, what you're looking at there... So, so, is that a long... Oh, sorry. That's I'm a guessing. long exposure. Long exposure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, correct. At a racetrack. You're looking at two of the most famous corners on the planet. Air Rouge and La Radion. At Spa Franco Shops. Nice. So they're all race cars coming past it. Those are GT3 cars at the Spa 24 Hour. And if you're ready for a story, I went over there with my friend and I was working with him as part of the race team, uh, competing for the very first time at Spa, uh, racing, I believe for the first time, if I recall correctly, uh, for an outfit called Kessel Racing, run by a gentleman by the name of Ronnie Kessel, who are based in Switzerland, and we were running 458 GT3s. I'm just some Yahoo from Brisbane, and I'm there at fucking Spa with Ferrari's factory <laughs> yeah. GT3 team, and my other mate from Brizzy going, how the fucking fuck did we get here? And we'd made friends with the rest of our team, uh, a gentleman who we'd met through Aston Martin Racing, if you see that little car just over there, little blue ex, yeah, that that little guy at the back there. Uh, One of the fellas joined us on the Ferrari junket. And look, all was going, you know, we we were having a fucking great time, mate. Like, yeah, you know, smashing Pearson out there and your cars and the whole thing. Um, I would generally know, because I'd be out doing media stuff because that's my bit. And I, I would always know sort of how often you'd see the car and you'd see it X number of minutes because I'd reposition to always know where the car was. And I'm like, I haven't seen the car for a while. I was probably in the pits getting a few things done. Yeah, that's where it is. And then I'm like, fuck, it's been a bit longer. And then I saw a chopper flying in and I'm like, it's not good. And then I'm like, it's some fucking weird going on here because there were no comms. You couldn't, you know, I'm in the fucking trees over at, the other end of the thing and I started just walking back because I only had two foot power and I found out that our teammate Marcus uh, there was a gentleman that was in that race that punted him from the back so they were at full noise and these are GT3 aero cars so they're you know he's doing late 200s He's punted it from the back, which has unloaded the arrow, and he's gone at mid-200s into a concrete barrier. Now, it doesn't matter how good your fucking roll cage is and how good your hands device is, 
when you go from 200 bucks to zero, it broke his hands device, it fucking shattered his neck, like the car caught, like just everything that could go wrong. We're in Belgium, if I get my countries correct. He's airlifted out. We're aware that something's very wrong. He's being taken to hospital. It's night time by then. We're in a car. We're trying to find the fucking hospital. We can't speak the language. We don't know where we are. We don't know where we're going. We're just trying to find the fucking hospital to find our mate. We don't know if he's alive. We don't know if he's dead. All we've been told is that it's very bad. It was very bad. Um, he had smoke inhalation, body fuck, like bad, 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 bad. I met his to then, you know, fiancé at the time. I met her for the first time that morning at the hospital the next... because she flew in overnight. And, like, I went from, like, the highest of highs, like, fucking top of the world to some of the, like... some of the hardest moments I have personally experienced watching somebody that I've become dear friends with just get fucking pummeled and he's at the point where they've got the fucking tube down his throat so he can breathe and like all the very worst things of motorsport, everything you hope will never happen. And look, I'm very pleased to say that he lived but he lives with the consequences of that and he's not the man he was before that. That photo... 12 months later, we went back and we fucking hit that place again. In my mind, before I went to Spa, that very first time where everything went fucking horribly wrong, I had in my mind this photo. I knew that I wanted to t make this photo. I knew I wanted to bring this shot into existence. And I stood there 12 months later, it was midnight, yeah, to the right-hand side of that, there's a fucking dance party going on. The whole thing's like... Doof, doof, doof. You know, there's some superstar DJ over there. There's fucking thousands of people. I think there were 10,000 people over there. Then there's a full fucking paddock of GT3 cars. Behind me is the big pub that's going off. And I just stood there and I took the photo that I had had in my mind for over a year... And I made that fucking photo and then I went back to the motorhome that we were staying in because you get the, those big pimp motorhomes and that's what you live in at the tracker there. And I sat there from like 2am to 4am. So that's a layered photo. It's multiple things. And I sat there and I photoshopped it and I put it all together. And I think that, yeah, so it must have been the year 20... I'm trying to do the math year 2015, 2016, I can't quite remember. It was probably 2015. And I remember sharing that photo and putting it out there into the world. And you know your Facebook header cover? That's the last time I changed it. Because that photo, that to me, that is life, that is motorsport, that is everything that we go through. It is the highest of highs, the lowest of lows, getting fucking beaten to the ground finding your way back and trying again. That is the most special photo I've ever taken. And it's just fucking trailing lights in a paddock. But what it means to me, and every time I look at it, I simultaneously want to cry and smile and fucking jump out of my skin. So there's that photo. Mm. Obviously, I noticed it was something <laughs> special. Very, very special. <laughs> yeah. and, cool. But that's what, it, that, that's what that photo is. It, it is, to me, that is... And, and this was something that I felt... I did a lot of 24-hour races. And there's something about that level of intensity to me. It's like it condenses all of life down into 48 hours. You get every emotion with an intensity that's hard to describe to people and you go through just 
excitement and exhaustion and a horror and terror and joy to a degree that is very hard to explain. Mm. You don't really hear that much about that sort of racing in the mainstream, do you? Not here in Australia, Australia mate. Or F1 and yeah. whatnot. But, but yeah. that was and, – and again, this is just – you know, this is some dickhead from Brisbane that found his fucking way there by sheer accident. And these are things that develop you into the person that you become. And watching these things and seeing these things and getting to meet these people and getting to meet extraordinary people and see extraordinary things... Mm. And it, 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 all these things fundamentally changed me. And a lot of them, you don't fully appreciate the magnitude of what you're doing until much later. Yeah. Because you're just there and you're just doing it and you're just trying to do your very best and you've got so many other problems going on and your family and your life and your kids and your business and all these other fucking things. But when you look back at that time, you go, holy shit. And all the little bits and pieces I've got around here, each one of those, uh, they're, they're all things that just make me go, holy shit. And they make me remember a yeah. time. Memories. Mate, go. really special memories. And special people and special times and special opportunities. Because they're, they're the catalysts for adventure and for... What do they say? What did Robin Williams say? You gotta suck the marrow out of life, you know. <laughs> oh, captain, my captain. So, yeah. It's that. Take the take the opportunities. And Fucking the, oath. And the adventures while you can. And then sure. give it everything you've got. Yeah. Because yeah. Well, they don't come around twice, mate. They That's don't. It. it doesn't <sighs> knock again. Yeah. yeah, it's wild stuff. That's the most intense picture out there. Each, each other one doesn't have a long story. This is just a talented Brisbane man who now lives overseas and. Uh, 24 for 24. So, Jason Fong. He paints 24 watercolours, one an hour, at Le Mans. That's very... What? <laughs> Why does he put himself through that? Because <laughs> he can. But and for, he, and how? He, how? And he raises money away? and he... But I don't know. He's a weapon. Yeah, right. That's, and that's I've really bought... Yeah, I've bought three of his pieces so far. Two of them hang here. Oh, yeah. so one he of them paints them and then yeah. like auctions them off. And then the auctions them off. Them. Yeah, and so you can sort of just go, hey, I want to buy this one. Yeah, cool. And uh, I, I got into it in mid-COVID because, again, just sitting at home scratching yourself. <laughs> and, I'm, you know, you've got enough time to, like, watch stuff and yeah. get into art. And But, again, it's supporting people having a go. And I'm like, that's wicked. Yeah. That then got me into framing, which takes you down another rabbit hole. <laughs> but again, how good's a rabbit hole? <laughs> yeah, right. It's bloody brilliant. Now, mate, we've now done three hours and ten minutes. Um, and I've got to attempt to go and be a good dad at some point. Mm. And you've got to go to dinner. Mate, this has been fucking great. I've really enjoyed... Thanks for the chat. ...talking smack with you, mate. Thanks <laughs> for bringing the beers. No worries. What a legend. Fuck. I'll leave you with those noose of beers so you can get me in trouble. Like, uh, I don't know. Think how good noose is, maybe. I don't know. Mate, noose is it's good. actually probably the best thing about noose is that beer. <laughs> it's yeah. quite good. Yes. What they need to do, though, is put the leopard print on it so that it make it more authentically noose. Put more O's in it. More New news. News. it yeah, it needs an N E W S A. If they could spell it properly, I'd be so much happier with them. <laughs> Noosa. There's a lot of Noosa number plates in Noosa. Yeah. I, I should get N E W S A. Yeah. Like N3 W5A. Noosa. 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 <laughs> and then get it wrapped in leopard print yeah. and have shiny gold wheels. And you'll be the coolest yeah. cat in Noosa. I think my, my BT50 will look amazing. Bloody terrific. <laughs> Mate, I'm going to wind it up on that note. Alan, Turbo Yoda. Allied performance. This has been an absolute cracker. Thanks for having me.
Mate, for people that want to follow any of your adventures or ask you to make dumb shit, <laughs> how may they approach you? Is this possible or are you disappearing from the internet? No, I'm not disappearing. I've, I've got uh, Instagram, which I don't really know how to use because I'm too old. Good start. But, but I do have like teenage sons. So you got a TikTok yet, mate? Were, oh, no. Fuck. No, I don't want to go there. Come on. I could see you dancing. It sucks way too much time out of your <laughs> life. Uh, yeah, so I got, I, got uh, I think it's called Turbo Yoda Alloyed or something like that mm. on, on Insta. So I'll have to. I kind of like gave up on that when I had a YouTube channel because, you know, how, how much do you need to market yourself? A lot. So now that I don't have the YouTube responsibilities, I, I'll put a bit on Insta and uh, on so the gram. you can see some stuff that I'm building, I suppose. Hell yeah. And, uh, yeah, don't really, like I said, I've got a lot of work on, so I'm not really... You know, not really looking? Not really doing any oil yeah, changes or anything. <laughs> what if people are looking for something stupid? Uh, they go, do you know what I want? I want something fucking ridiculous. Yeah. I want to put a Duramax in something. Yeah. Yep. In a uh, 60 series. Oh, it's just with an aluminium body. <laughs> 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 and then make it wheel stand. But just, just have to win lotto first. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so if you have one lotto and you've got a 60, yeah. then... And a billion uh, dollars. Alloyed, uh, I think it's like alloydperformance.com or something like that. I'm pretty bad at this. Your marketing is so <laughs> fucking terrible. terrible. Right? Jesus Christ, yeah. you must be good at what you do. <laughs> <laughs> oh... Yeah. Well, like I've got a website, I don't know what it is. Look uh, it up on the internet. Yeah, I think it's you should, you should be there somewhere. You'll find me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you want to find me, you'll find me. Yeah, that's use that's, the force. That's not too far off <laughs> that, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> that's a fucking glorious place to find yourself, mate. Yep, it is actually pretty nice. I'll, I agree. You've done good. Thank you. That is uh Do you feel contentment? Bit of zen. Yeah. Mm. Uh, feel good about uh, the future and whatnot. You know, it's all about watching the kids become young adults and spending time with them and my wife and my dog and uh, going dirt bike riding and traveling. That's pretty much in between building cars. The, the I don't think there's much better than that. Not Mate, for me, anyway. You've nailed it. I don't think it gets any better than that. Well, on that note, Turbo Yoda, thank you, sir. Cheers, mate. For everybody listening, catch you next time on All Red Everything. <laughs>